I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. On this edition of the program, we're continuing our celebration of the spooky season as Halloween rapidly approaches. This time, we've got a previously unreleased conversation I had with Gary J. Tunnicliffe. If you're unfamiliar with that name, Gary is a legend in the arena of special makeup effects and creature design who has worked on such films as My Bloody Valentine 3D, Blade, Piranha 3 Double D, David Fincher's Gone Girl, Joe Dante's Burying the X, and entries in such well-known horror franchises as Candyman, Halloween, Feast, The Exorcist, Pumpkinhead, and, most famously, Hellraiser. Now, I have to warn you, this is a monster-sized edition of Parallax Views, and as such, I want to keep the intro short. Needless to say, if you've ever wondered about the tricks used to make movie magic treats in your favorite horror movies, well, then this is the episode for you. And with that being said, let's get right to the conversation with special makeup effects artist Gary J. Tunnicliffe. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. Before we continue our conversation on this edition of Parallax Views, I want to notify California listeners of the program about one of our sponsors, the Therapy Practice of Alexander Yu. Yu is an experienced teletherapist since 2008, and he goes by the motto, Flow, adapt, change, as Lao Tzu would say. And he wants to accompany you on your journey of self-improvement. Now, again, this applies to California listeners of the program. Alexander is a licensed psychotherapist and teletherapist. And if you'd like his services, then please Contact him at Alexander U. That's Alexander U. Y O O dot com. And he can be reached by email at therapy at Alexander U dot com or by phone at three two three eight three four nine eight two eight. That's three two three. 8349828 This is only available once again to my California listeners but if you need anything related to therapy needs please be sure to contact our sponsor Alexander Yu Welcome to Parallax Views Legendary special makeup effects artist Gary J. Tunnicliffe. Perfect. Of, of yeah, we were just talking about if I would pronounce it right. I got it. Yes. Uh, if for people that don't know, Gary's been involved in such movies as Ginger Snaps. Oh, uh, uh, barely Ginger Snaps, really. I mean, I mean, it's so funny. You know, you, you're introducing me, and you pick one movie that I worked, you know, like for probably a week on for a friend of mine, Paul Jones. But I mean, go ahead. What else were you going to say? And and I'll. Oh, I was going to say uh, uh, two can two different Candyman films. Yes. Also, burying the X, uh, underrated little Joe Dante movie, Scary Movie Five, Piranha Three Double D. 
yeah. Scream 4, yes. uh, Halloween 6, and Halloween Resurrection, and uh, the Feast uh, trilogy, as well as, of course, the one that I have to name because it's the one you're most known for, the Hellraiser movies. Oh, yeah, that's right. I worked on a couple of those, yeah. I actually just did a thing last night. I was calculating. Um, there was a bit of a debacle a while back. Somebody um, somebody said that I was the self-proclaimed mayor of Hellraiser Town, which I, I thought was utter BS, and I, I've never proclaimed I was the, the Lord Mayor of Hellraiser Town. Uh, but um, I went and calculated uh, roughly how much time I've spent on Hellraiser movies. And with pre-production and shooting, and this is just on doing makeup effects, um, and then, of course, with writing and directing one of the Hellraiser movies, it adds up conservatively, I would say, to 114 weeks of my life I've spent on Hellraiser movies. Wow. So over two years of working on Hellraiser movies. So you know what? Yeah, I am the Lord Mayor of Hellraiser Town. I've worked on more on Hellraiser more than anybody else. So, uh, yeah, you know, it might not have been the best Hellraiser movies, but, um, yeah, a lot of time on the Hellraiser movies. I mean, uh, Feast, I did the first film, really. Second and third one, I, uh, I actually... You got a credit for the original creature design, I think, in those ones, right? Yeah, and, and I was there because I came into the second unit direction, but John Gulliger wouldn't use any of the stuff that I did. John, John was funny. He didn't want me there as the second unit director. The producers wanted me there. Um, but I know he didn't use... He probably used one or two shots, which I thought was hilarious because... I said to the producers at the time, he, John won't use any of this. He won't use any of the footage I shoot. Um, and they were like, we know, but we want you to shoot some stuff. And I shot whole sequences. And everybody said the sequences were really cool. But I knew John wouldn't use it because uh, that's the way John is. But uh, they paid me. So, I mean, it was fine. I basically, I, we would literally spend days playing, um, uh, me and my DP and my producer would literally play uh, uh, putt golf in the, in the offices, the production office, you know, just kind of sitting around. But and the creature effects were done by Glenn Hetrick, who went on to do Face Off and um, Star Trek Discovery, I believe. But uh, yeah, Glenn, we gave them all the molds and they ran the creatures. They didn't actually do the creatures as well as I would have liked. But um, the first film, yeah, I, I, I kind of really own the designs on that. And uh, that was actually a very exciting project to work on because we were doing Project Greenlight at the time. So we had cameras everywhere and all that kind of stuff. So, so for my listeners uh, that may be unfamiliar with your work, I have a, a broad range of listeners. Some are into my current event shows, some are into my movie shows. Maybe you could tell my listeners how you got into makeup effects work and also what goes into makeup effects or special effects in general. Um, so special makeup effects um, is a declining uh, part of the industry, I believe. But I mean, really, um, it's, it's prosthetic makeup and special makeup effects, which are decapitations or arms being broken or monster suits and creatures and that kind of thing. I mean, really, when I got into makeup effects, which was the heyday, you know, I was inspired by the works of Rick Baker and Rob Bottin, who did things like The Thing and American Wolf in London, and the work of Dick Smith, who's kind of the godfather of makeup effects, who did The Exorcist and, uh, and stuff like that. He also did uh, the Amadeus makeup, uh, for which he got an Oscar. Tom Savini, who did the Day of the Dead movies and stuff like that. So... These are kind of the uh, th those were kind of the heroes of the industry, and in the early eighties, you know, this was the boom of rubber monster time. You know what I mean? Um, and and I was a kid living in um, uh, you know a pretty blue collar area of England, uh, very close to Birmingham, um, a place called Litchfield. And I was kind of like uh, 12, 13, 14 years old and uh, kind of had aspirations of being an actor, actually. You know, I mean, I just didn't want to become an electrician like my dad or work in a restaurant or something. You know, I mean, I had lofty goals. So um, I literally remember being at a friend of mine's house, um, a drummer. Um, I was singing in a band at the time and uh, he had a copy of a magazine called Fangoria. Um, which I'd never even heard of. And there's this garish colored magazine. And there it was with all horror movies, which I, I loved horror movies. Um, Did you grow up on the Hammer and the Amicus horror films? Yeah, absolutely. Massive fan. I mean, in, in England, uh, we only had three, three, TV, three TV channels when I was growing up. Um, but every Friday night, they would do a horror movie. It was kind of like, you know, the, the Friday night shocker or whatever, you know what I mean? So it was always a, a Hammer horror movie or an Amicus movie. Um, uh, or, you know, one of the universal kind of classics. And and that was, I mean, at, at seven years old, I was watching those. I vividly remember begging my mother that I could stay up and watch Taste the Blood of Dracula when I was seven. And when kids, you know, as a child, you would have to go in on a Monday morning and 
you know, the first thing the teacher would get you to do is talk about your weekend. And mine was always about, you know, literally a review of a horror movie with Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing. Um, and it was just, I mean, that's really what I wanted to be more than anything else. I wanted to be Peter Cushing or Christopher Lee. So I, I, I got to ask, uh, if you're watching all these hammer horror and amicus horror and British horror films uh, when you're growing up, uh, who was your your scream queen crush? You know, was it Ingrid Pitt? Was it Barbara Still? Hazel Court? Who was, the, who was your? I think it was. It, wow, I actually got another name. Was it Yvonne Mollar who was in um, Brides of Dracula? Yes. She was yeah. Yeah. Really fucking hot. That she was so beautiful. But I remember literally at twelve years old because it was really weird because um, my dad was an electrician and he used to kind of fall asleep in front of the TV. You know, he, he would work all day and you kind of get in, eat some food, and he would fall asleep. My mother was a restaurant uh, manageress, so. Friday night, I would kind of stay up late and get to watch these movies. And I, I remember vividly my dad being asleep on the sofa while I'm watching these movies. And I think, you know, this is pre-internet, pre, uh, you know, where you could get your jollies anyway. But as a 12-year-old, seeing naked breasts in a movie was like crazy. So I vividly remember seeing Twins of Evil or, you know, um, uh, Witchfinder General or something, you know, literally, you know, the, the witch hunters and... You know, and seeing, uh, yeah, definitely Twins of Evil. I, I remember my dad being asleep and me being like, oh, my God, look at this, like naked female breasts and praying that my dad wouldn't wake up and suddenly banish me to uh, to go to bed, you know what I mean? But, I mean, um, yeah, I always thought Yvonne Mollard was really hot in uh, in in, uh, in Brides of Dracula, which I really loved that movie anyway. I always thought that was a really, really, for some reason, I know it gets a lot of stick and everyone like didn't like David Peel. Because, you know, Christopher Lee was the kind of ultimate uh, Dracula. But I thought he was great as the Baron Meister. And I thought it was really a really well done movie. It had some great moments in it. And I thought the killing especially. And I, it was the first time we saw um, Van Helsing get bitten and then kind of have to deal with the bite. And then I just loved the way they killed him at the end with the, uh, the, the windmill turning it into a crucifix. I just thought that was so cool. So, um, yeah, uh, definitely my first uh, crushes were... Uh, <laughs> were uh, well, you know, I think that those two girls from Twins of Evil were pretty hot as well. Weren't they two Playboy models or something? Yeah, I, I think so. I always, I always dug uh, Carolyn Monroe, who oh, was yeah. in. She was in those Hammer films, but then later on, she's in some of the slashers like Slaughter High and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Was Carolyn Monroe? Which, which one? Which, who was the girl who went on to be in? Um, who was the girl in uh, Spy Who Loved in uh, Spy Who Loved Me? That was her. Yeah, 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 she played she one of the helicopter. minor villains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's the helicopter pilot, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that wink, she winks at Roger Moore. Yeah, she was really hot as well, absolutely. Uh, and and still hot even now. I think I saw a recent interview with her, like on a Bond thing, and I was like, damn, she's still really good looking. <laughs> so <laughs> we've gone a little bit off topic. I'm going to take it back. So you're, you're growing up on these horror films. It sounds like a fun time. Uh, and then you find Fangoria. Yeah, Fangoria. So... Um, this buddy of mine, like we're talking about music and stuff, and suddenly I'm looking at this Fangoria and I'm just, I literally get sucked into this magazine. And, and what I noticed more than anything else was they were actually showing people building creatures. And what I noticed was the guys who were building the creatures all seemed to have long hair and we're all wearing heavy metal T-shirts. So I was like, wow, this is really cool stuff. And I was like, do you have any, do you have any more of these magazines? And he was kind of wealthier than me and had a little bit more money, his parents did. So he opened his closet door and like a thousand, like a hundred of these magazines fell out. And I just took them all home and read through them. And um, and literally within weeks, I'd gone out and bought some clay and started practicing doing this stuff. And it was really strange because I was, I was not really that artistic at school. I, you know, my art lessons would literally be me drawing movie uh, movie posters or um, band posters. You know, I wouldn't want to draw any of the still life stuff that the art teacher wanted me to do. Really, I was interested in what I was interested in. So I didn't know I could sculpt. And I remember sculpting this bus straight away. My mum kind of saying, I didn't know you could sculpt. And I was like, I didn't know I could sculpt either. But for the next two years, that was all I really did. I focused on that. And I was just reading magazines and trying to find um, books at the library. Again, you couldn't get anything. There was no internet. You had to kind of find everything. So it was reading Fangoria. There was one magazine store in Birmingham I used to go to called Nostalgia and Comics, and they had a, copies of Starlog and Cinefix and stuff like that. And it just became a, an obsession. Um, and I started doing makeups on my sister, who was two years younger than me. I would give her allowance money and kind of to let me do a makeup on her. And um, that just those makeups grew from five minute makeups to 10 minute makeups to one hour makeups to doing full face casts 
to uh, getting making more elaborate stuff and i took over part of this we had a little tiny garage and it started off with a part of the countertop and it got bigger and bigger and bigger until by the time i was 17 or 18 i mean i got a pretty a pretty big portfolio um and i found the address of uh, christopher tucker who did the elephant man and sent him some pictures and he invited me down to his house where he had his studio and uh, he kind of looked at my work and said, yeah, you need to try this. You need to try that. And then about three or four months later, he called me and said, we're doing a project. Would you like to come down on the weekends? And I started going down on the weekends and uh, and working for him doing um, we were running appliances for um, the Phantom of the Opera stage show. Uh, and it involved re- replicating that makeup and copying it and just lots and lots of little projects. It was um, it was really, really exciting time because it was like suddenly I'd got my foot in the door. So it's always been interesting to me. It seems like in the world of special makeup effects, there's like uh, it, it's it's a pretty small world in some ways. Like the names that stand out, your name, uh, Rob Bettine, uh, John Carl Bushler. Uh, it's it, is it a small world, or are there just a lot of people that don't get credited enough? It's a very small world, actually. Um, I think it's like a. Uh... Um, this, might, this might sound really arrogant. I think it's like anything. I think if, you, if you're good at it, you know, then you uh, you tend to stick around. And that's not necessarily. I would say that's a combination of talent, tenacity, and also um, uh, delivering the goods. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, there are probably people who are brilliant artists who might be a bit flamboyant and a bit uh, egocentric who probably don't get hired because they just can't deliver on time or deliver to the number they're supposed to do. But yeah, it actually is a fairly small community. Um, I think being a makeup effects designer, there's a, and this kind of came from the the characters of the eighties. Um, there's definitely a sort of a, a caricature that you have to be, um, which doesn't necessarily mean you're the greatest of talents because there are some brilliant, brilliant artists who've worked on numerous projects for various different designers in town, uh, in Hollywood, who um, are probably unknown to the general public. Um, they're known amongst the community of designers, you know what I mean? Because we would hire them as much as possible. But I mean, I think it's like anything, uh, you know, talent outs. And I think um, what I was known for, if you look at my resume, and yes, there's a lot of numbers after it. I mean, it's kind of scary. I used to say that for a while, my resume never got longer. It got wider (laughs) because it was like number two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know, my resume reads like a score chart you know like you're reading out results from a a football game you know what i mean like you know halloween six you know hellraiser three you know it's like you know they're all they're all numbers candyman two you know well candyman three actually i never did candyman two i did candyman one and candyman three um but what i was if you look at my resume and look at the producers i worked with um i worked with the same producers again and again and again and again uh some producers i worked with on 16 18 20 films so really those producers were people who just said, look, you always deliver, you know, whatever number you say you're going to bring it in for you do, you do a great job. It works. Everything you do works, you know, and that's why we, uh, we hired you. I mean, there were, there were several times I picked up work from fairly notable directors because they said, we've worked with other makeup effects guys um, and we get to shoot the stuff on the day and it's not ready or it doesn't work on the day. And, you know, every time we've heard that your stuff works, so um, that's a, that was a nice, um, a nice badge of honor to have, you know, especially working with some well-known directors who were like, look, you know, that guy's great, but it, stuff never worked or it took hours to set up and we don't have time for that. But I've heard that you can come in and you can kind of get it done on time and it will work and you will deliver the goods. So that's why we're coming to you. So, um, you know, I suspect it's, it's like anything. There are tears or there certainly were tears in uh, the makeup effects industry. For a while, I, I always remember feeling it was like um, you had like Soter effects and people like that. And then it was K&B and Altarian Studios, which is Tony Gardner and myself. And then you had this next level, which was Greg Cannon and Stan Winston and Rick Baker. And those were the top guys, you know what I mean? Like the top tier. Didn't, uh, uh, Steve Johnson, too. He had his own makeup effects thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, Steve had uh, several. <laughs> it was um, – so for a while it was uh, – was it XFX was his main company? Um, but yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, Steve, who I, I don't really get on with very well, unfortunately, um, but I've always admired his design uh, ethic and always thought he he thought outside of the box. And um, really what's interesting about Steve is, is that he had 
uh, a couple of people who worked for him who were uh, exceptionally talented um, and went on to great careers because he kind of hired them to kind of run things for him. So Joel Harlow, who's a brilliant makeup effects designer, and uh, Michael Azaldi, who went on to form Spectral Motion, were all people who worked at uh, Steve Johnson's company. And kind of, uh, I mean, that's how, if you look at Michael Azaldi, for instance, Spectral Motion, I remember work, knowing Mike when Spectral Motion was a model company that made two model kit busts, and Mike was working for Steve Johnson. Mike spoke Spanish, and he was hired to work for Steve Johnson and was heading the effects work for Steve on Blade 2. And he got on really, really well with Guillermo. Uh, so when Guillermo came to do Hellboy, he just wanted Mike. So he just hired Mike. You know what? I'm glad you mentioned Blade because I think that's a good segue. You worked on the death effect for the villain Frost, you know, where he explodes at the end after getting a serum stuck in his head. DTA, what yeah. goes into designing that? Like, what's the process? Uh, how does it start? How does it end? I actually did. I did more than that on um, Blade. Uh, Stephen Ryington, who's the director on Blade, I I've known Steve for since nineteen since nineteen eighty nine. Steve was on Alien Three, and uh, yeah, I actually hired. Did I hire Steve? I lost image animation the studio i worked at in in england which is the studio that did the first hellraiser movie uh their studio was over the road literally from the alien 3 uh studio and steve norrington had worked at uh, image animation and they used to pop into the studio all the time and hang out so i knew steve um and actually helped him out a little bit on um uh, death machine and a thing he did called Terror of Blood Mansion. The first thing that Steve ever directed was a thing called Terror of Blood Mansion, and I let him use the studio space. And then he did a Death Machine, and I had an idea for a puppeting system on that. I didn't actually work on the film, but I saw an effect he was doing and said, you should do that. And he was like, that's a good idea. That's the uh, movie so, with Brad Dorif, right? That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And Brad Dorif's basically channeling, if you know there's an artist or a makeup effects artist called Chris Cunningham, who's now known as Chris Hall, so he, that was his name then, but Chris Cunningham, who did Rubber Johnny and stuff like that, that character that Brad Dourif plays is really based on Chris Cunningham. Um, but Steve, so when Steve came over to LA and was actually staying at my house when he got Blade, um, he'd hired Greg Cannon really as a, as a, a, a favor back to Greg because he knew Greg from working on Greystoke. So he said to me, look, there are certain things in the film that we need that Greg won't do. Like I made a lightweight body of the female lead, Karen, that Wesley starts to carry around. And we did kind of little bits here and there. And then when the film needed to reshoot the ending, actually, no, here's what happened. They did reshoots, first of all, and the, the effect that they asked me to do was there's a scene where two assassins get stabbed with EDTA uh, material, and they both blow up. And we did mechanical heads of those characters uh, that were motion controlled. So I did that for a very low number, and they worked. And when it came to do the reshoots, Steve said, I want you to come in and do all of the makeup effects now for the end of the film. So I did Brad, uh, I did Stephen Dorff's teeth. We did the blood, the bladder makeup. Um, but going back to your question about what goes into the design of that, for me, nothing, because Steve Norrington designs everything to the nth degree. So um, I did a couple of little maquettes, but really Steve was very, Steve's a brilliant designer and a brilliant artist. So he drew what he wanted and then we just built it. And all I did was make sure that I hired the very best sculptors I could get. I hired Hiroshi Katagiri. I hired Brian Wade. I hired Bill Zahn. And they sculpted the two uh, creatures and then the two stages uh, and the makeup. And then Gabe Bartolos, who's another great makeup artist, molded the bodies for me and ran the foams. Then I painted them with Steve Lawrence. And that was what we did. So, I mean, um, really in that situation, Steve Knighton is – Crazy genius, you know, an absolute genius, though. And he knew exactly what he wanted. So it was like, I want you to build this and this and this. Um, Steve's a tricky character, though. I mean, he's a tricky character. Like, at one point, they asked me to, um, they wanted me to build a womb. There was going to be a sequence. Oh, that's right. I built the, the the baby of Blade. I built loads of little bits in that film. It's always really weird. I always think I just did the ending of Blade. And then when I watched the movie, I'm like, oh, yeah, I made that. Um, we made the baby of Blade, and it's actually my girlfriend at the time who's the nurse carrying the the baby. But when we made the baby, originally Steve wanted to do like a a um a scene inside the womb, like a POV. And he said, We won't do it digitally, we'll just build like a womb. So he said to me, I want you to build like a womb, like a wibbly wobbly sack that we can shoot through. 
And and I never I forget I got the call to go down to the studio and I walked in and there was Steve and the producers and Steve said oh, I want you to build this womb and I said oh okay how big do you want it to be and he said I want it this big and he held his hands up and I pulled out a Polaroid camera this again this is before digital cameras and uh, you know before phone cameras so I pulled out a Polaroid camera and I took a photo of him doing this and he looked at me and he smiled and he looked at the producer and he, he went and I said now how tall do you want it to be and he went this big. And I took another photo and he said, ha ha, he said, see, you see, he said, say, this is a clever guy. He said, Gary is a clever guy. He said, do you know why he just did that? And they went like, no, why did he do that? He said, because he know he knows that I'm an asshole. And about six weeks from now, when he's on set, he's going to go, why is it this big? It should be this big, right? And he knows that he's got a photo now of me saying it's this big. So I fucked myself and he's got a photo of it. He said, that's why he did it. He said, that's clever. That's how to deal with an asshole like me. So. It's crazy to think about it uh, now. That was in 98, and some movies were already moving towards CGI. I think movies like uh, Spawn were doing more CGI things. But that uh, the death of Frost and Blade was basically practical effects, right? It's practical and then hand- 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 digitally. It's, it's, it's morphs and warps. That they're running over the top of it, you know. It's a bladder makeup on Steven that was shot on green, and then it's two giant, uh, literally static puppets, like blown up giant raspberry men as we called them uh, and then they just walked and morphed in between and blown up and in fact the final blowing up version is a an 18 inch high wax miniature uh that's so big you know that we made like a, a little wax version because um we knew we, we tried to blow up the big version and it didn't blow up it was really funny we wrapped it in uh deck cord uh and we blew it up and it just took off and flew about 100 feet into the air uh and it was like yeah of course you can't blow up a giant latex puppet so steve said i i we we tried to shoot it the night before and the special effects guy kind of failed uh and steve just kind of said yeah that was a that was a bust um and then next morning like 6 a.m in the morning i get a phone call it's 19 he's like tony cliff build a 18 inch high wax miniature exactly the same as it we'll give you this much money and so we did we made a wax oh a wax you know, uh, model of the final stage of the frost blowing up body, and it was hollow, so it was thick wax, but it was hollow. And then we just filled it with um, with blood to the very, very top, and we made two of them. <laughs> the first one, I remember Steve saying to the special effects guy, "Don't put too much, you know, don't put too much explosives in it. You know, it should hardly have anything in it." And uh, we shot it at something like ridiculous, like five thousand, you know, five hundred frames per second. And the guy put so much detonation, you know, so much zip cord in it, whatever, that when it blew up at 500 frames a second, it was there for one frame and it was gone for the next. It was just disappeared. It completely vaporized the whole thing. So all we ended up doing was putting a tiny charge in it and it blew the whole thing apart really nicely. But um, yeah, Steve was very specific about what he wanted. And what was funny about that movie was while we were making it, um, John Carpenter's Vampires was in production and everybody was saying, oh, Nobody cared about Blade at all. Nobody gave a damn. And everyone was really negative on it. And everyone was saying, oh, John Carpenter's Vampires is going to blow this out of the water. They've got James Woods. It's going to be amazing. And no one cares about this Blade movie, this Marvel Blade character. And, uh, you know, no one gives a damn. But we'd seen a rough cut of the um, the bloodbath sequence at the very beginning. And we, we knew. We all knew that it was going to blow everyone away. And, you know. Many years later, we're still talking about Blade, and nobody talks about John Carpenter's vampires. That that's true. I mean, there's so many Blade sequels now. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you: Do you ever have to improvise on set uh, when something goes wrong, or you know, when you need a quick fix for a certain effect? <laughs> yeah, all the time. <laughs> Any yeah. specific uh, stories stand out? I mean, everyone who says that the whole industry, you know, makeup effects industry is held together with, you know, super glue, zip ties and duct tape, you know what I mean? And it's true. I mean, um, I wish I'd have thought about this earlier on. I'm sure I'm sure some great story will come to come to mind. Um, a good one is an ex- a good example of, of a quick fix or not necessarily a quick fix, but actually ties back to Stephen Knighton. On Sleepy Hollow, there's an effect where um, Richard Griffiths is a heavy set guy. And uh, the rider rides up a hill and chops his head off and his head spins around three times and then flips off. Um, and for that particular effect, we built a, a head that was controlled by a, um, the spinning mechanism was a, a drill. 
a mechanical, you know, rotor drill to spin the head around. And then there was a, a, uh, a braking mechanism that stopped it. Uh, it was a, uh, a, a electric, uh, electric pin would shoot up, you know, like a mechanical pin would stop the head. So the head would spin, the brake would shoot up, stop the head and the head would flip over. And then we would cut. And the night before the mechanism broke and I remember sitting in the studio and, um, the engineers who built it uh, were literally going, we can't get another one of these, these mechanisms, this braking mechanism. It was a, uh, an electro, like an electromagnetic lock. And they said, we can't get one. What are we going to do? And everyone was having a meltdown because like we were shooting this the very next day and uh, we, you know, we can spin the head, but we can't stop it. What, what on earth are we going to do? And everyone was panicking. Can we get another electrical lock? Can we, how can we do this? It was a real nightmare. It was like two o'clock in the morning. Everyone was freaking out. And then suddenly I just remember laughing, bursting out, laughing out loud. And Tamsin Hanks, who was one of the people who worked on it, looked at me and said, you, you, you have a, you, do you, you, have you fixed it? Do you know what you, we can do? And I said, yeah, we're, we're going to do the, Stephen Norrington always said, you know, Occam's razor, whatever the simplest way is, is the easiest way. And they said, what should we do? And I said, attach a handle to the brake. And then I'm going to have somebody sit underneath the head and they're going to push the rod up <laughs> into the head. You know, that's all we're going to do. So, I mean, sometimes the simplest way is the easiest way. And I've always said, look, if a piece of chewing gum will make it work, it only has to last for the shot. This thing doesn't have to last forever. It doesn't have to work for a million years in a day. You know, it's not a Disneyland animatronic. It only has to last for one gag. So sometimes if you can shove your hand in something and wiggle it around, uh, do it. You know, I mean, looking back at things like Alien, and uh, you see Ridley Scott talking about when they look inside the egg and they see that thing, you know, that fleshy thing moving and Ridley Scott saying, yeah, it was me with a rubber glove on going like this, you know, going blah, 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 with my fingers. And that's the truth is that those things work the best. So sometimes it's very easy to get caught up in the, uh, oh, you know, we need this mechanical device and this thing. And, uh, you know, it's like, why don't you stick your finger up inside and wiggle it around? You know, I remember Stan Winston when he did the, the dog creature for the thing, <clears throat> you know, the first time the thing transforms inside the, um, with the dogs and that that creature kind of curls up and goes Rah! stan winston built that for rob Botin, and he said when we built it we literally based it on the shape that we could do with our hand we, we knew we we're going to be putting our hand through this through the set so it was like what can i do with my hand that will look cool you know and it was it was based on that movement so as i used to say many many times you know you you need a good animatronic this is a great animatronic it moves it works it's never going to break you know it's going to work every time because uh, I've sat on sets with these complex puppets and with rods and controllers and trying to get something to move and it doesn't work. And uh, so I can't think of anything more than that, really. But, but there's been many times where we've ended up super gluing things back together or things have popped open and we're trying to glue them and, and, and make them work on set. Or, you know, you sometimes um, trying to reshoot gags that have got very bloody is very tricky because they're trying to do someone's a creature bursting out of something, trying to get the thing folded back in for those few seconds of um, of, of, of the start of a shot. Now, nowadays, you just kind of CGI it out or you'd have a rod holding it and remove it digitally. But back in the practical days, you know, you'd have to hold things together with monofill lines and uh, bits of tape and stuff. You know, I still look at effects now from the old days and go, look, you can see the, you can see the, the line holding that together at the beginning of the shot. You know, you can see people pulling it apart, you know. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, I had another guest on recently, uh, the director of this new horror movie called uh, The Good Things Devils Do, and Kane Hodder's in it, and Linnea Quigley, and Bill Oberst Jr. It, it seems like a pretty cool Halloween horror flick, and I was asking about some of the effects they did, you know, because it's about a vampire, so it's very special effects heavy, uh, even though it's done on a shoestring sort of budget, and the director said to the DP, oh, don't give away all the secrets, uh, and he was kind of joking, but it's interesting. I know a lot of people that say, oh, if I know about how the special effects are done and the animatronics and the makeup, then maybe I won't like, maybe it'll take away the magic of the film. And I've always thought it was the opposite. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think these days, are there any secrets? I mean, there was, it used to get, it was really, really secretive back in the, uh, in the mid eighties. No one wanted to share any of the things they were doing, um, it's kind of crazy. Uh, the last thing I remember being really secretive is there was a makeup effect technique created for um, The Passion of the Christ, 
which is the kind of scar material that was worn by Jim Caviezel. Um, and we'd all heard about this frozen prosaic material that was being used, but no one would talk about it. No one would explain how it was done. Um, and that was the last time I remember being a big secret because everyone kind of looked up to and admired Dick Smith more than anybody else. And Dick was always very, look, share the technology and, uh, and share these techniques. But I mean, for a while, it was like those who have these techniques that potentially can earn more money. But um, yeah, I've always thought, uh, I mean, it's not like a magic trick, or like an illusion where once you know the illusion, it's ruined. I mean, I think anyone who watches The Thing or watches American War for London, clearly, you know, even though American War for London is superlative and absolutely brilliant, you know, there are shots where you look at it going, yeah, clearly that's a rubber body sticking out of a hole and he's got his head through it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's 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 pretty obvious, you know. Although I'll be honest, I'm always amazed when you say that to some people and they go, really? That's how they did it? You know, like, really? You didn't know that? I think like, a lot of people don't think about it. And then when they, some people like me, I'm like, how did they do that? I want to know how they did that. And I think other people are like, that ruins the, the movie when I'm watching it, which I can sort well, of understand, I guess. Yeah, I understand that. I mean, you know, my father, I've designed illusions for magicians, you know, in the past. And uh, my father's always like, well, how did they do that one? I'm like, well, you know, you, you know, it's like the old woman being sawn in half. You go, well, you, you clearly, you know, there's two people in there, one at the top and one at the bottom. Really, that's how they do it. I'm like, well, how, how the hell, how else would they do it? For Christ's sake, you know what I mean? I'm always, I'm always stunned when people ask me about magic tricks. I'm like, there's only one way to do that trick. You know, you know, that person's if they're flying, they're either on a there's a there's a fucking great rod sticking up there behind, or they're on a wire. And there's, it's the only two ways to do it. Third way is that they're actually, you know, a wizard and they're <laughs> they're actually <laughs> levitating. But no, they've either got a rod rammed up their bottom, or they're you know sticking at their back or something, or or they're on wires. That's the only way to do it. So I mean, um, I think there are effects. I mean, to me, I mean, obviously, you know, I tend to watch an effect, and clearly, you know how it's done, but through great editing and certain tricks you can go well that was that was really masterfully done that was brilliantly done or i was completely being tricked there they they led me to believe it was one thing and another and it and even now because of digital you can you can blur the lines so much more you can take a you know a bad dummy head and put digital eyes in it which will give it that extra bit of life you know what i mean uh, or have a jaw moving you know when a head's being cut off that that, that brings it to life even now i just did an effect actually for a friend of mine um they needed a makeup and i can't travel or they're shooting too far away and they don't have the budget but i said look i'll i'll make you a head on a stick you know just a fake head and then they're going to shoot that head doing a look and then their digital guy is going to put an eye blink on it you know and uh, so it's a, it's a great combination of techniques so um yeah i think i think there was definitely more um there was more kind of like, uh, how is that done in the past? I think now, I think what is surprising now is the amount of times that people see an effect and go, oh, that's digital. And you go, actually, no, that's practical. That's a, that's a makeup effect. That's actually been, that's actually a puppet that's built. So it's nice. I think, uh, especially like in the Star Wars movies, when you'd assume that all the creatures were digital, there are a lot of the creatures were built like by Neil Scanlon and they are actually puppets, you know, they're not digital creations. You know, it's, it's interesting. I wanted to ask you about, uh, the Halloween movies because she worked on two of them, and I wanted to ask about Halloween: The Curse of Michael almost, Myers. And almost it, it, three, actually, almost three Halloween movies. Oh, really? Okay, well, we'll actually, get into that. Four, actually, almost four, actually, four Halloween movies. Technically, I should have worked on, but uh, yeah. Well, the reason I mentioned Halloween: The Curse of Michael Myers, and for okay. my listeners that are unfamiliar, sixth film in the franchise, plagued by production issues, they had to reshoot a lot of stuff. You're credited as additional makeup effects artist were you brought in for the reshoots when they wanted to make it gorier and they were kind of annoyed that it was more uh, like a normal suspense film in a lot of ways before the reshoots yeah that's when i was nicknamed the, that's when i became known as the uh, the miramax assassin or the hollywood assassin because they would literally call me up and say we need to kill some people in cool ways can you come in and fix this so i got the call um i think we just done uh hellraiser bloodline um, and they'd finished shooting uh, Halloween six and they were they wanted to reshoot and go back in and, and amp up some of the kills. Um, so I came in for like a week and a, or two weeks and we did the I actually not only did I did we do the kills, but I also came with some ideas for it and did some storyboards like the girl on the um, the piece of farm machinery, you know, and I said, you know, 
because I actually described, they were like, what can we do? And I said, well, have you got one of those, like a cool piece of farm machinery? He can throw her onto it. And then they were like, oh, that's cool. I said, no, no, no. What is Michael Myers? He would then turn it on. You know, he would then go and turn the machine on. And they liked that. So we made the mechanism that the blades would move in her chest. Uh, and the guy's head being crushed to the bars. And um, and then we had a, a we did a scene where we smashed Michael's head in with a, a metal pole. So it was um, at the time I was doing a bunch of that sort of stuff for uh, for Dimension. Um, that's kind of when I was getting my early start with those guys, and uh, I was doing like I think we did we did reshoots on Halloween Six, and we did um, trailer inserts for Wolf Creek at the same time, or very very close. And then Joe Chappelle, who did Halloween Six, came over and did most of the reshoots for um, Hellraiser Bloodline. I think because we we shot the original shoot for Hellraiser Bloodline was a six week shoot uh, with the first director. And then we did three sets of reshoots, which were each two weeks over the next year. So we kept going back and doing more shoots on Hellraiser uh, Bloodline, more shoots on Hellraiser Bloodline and Joe Chappelle uh, directed those. So in the end, by the time the film was finished, Joe Chappelle had directed just as much as the original director. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I was just watching uh, Halloween, the curse of Michael Myers again. And you know, one of the early oh, kills, God. Paul Rudd, right? Yeah, Paul Rudd. Yeah. Before he was uh, Mr. Comedy, he was uh, Mr. Tommy Doyle in Halloween 6. And he was like, yeah, he was was like Halloween 6 and clueless. Like he was kind of like a young kind of like study guy. He was, you know, then before he he said Mr. Comedy. Well, it's interesting because I, I was watching the opening, you know, and there's that one scene where they twist the guy's head. Yeah. And you know his neck just literally pops out, right? There's blood that everywhere. John Binkley did that effect. What's that? John Binkley actually did that effect. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm just interested because when you have to do reshoots like that, how are you able to match it up with uh, the sort of alternate footage that is already being used? Uh, usually, the editor has produced a. Uh, if they're going to cut it in, the editor has kind of like you've got a cut scene, and it'll just say. Scene, shot missing, shot missing, shot missing. So then you have to match it to those shots. And if you're doing continuity, you've got pictures of the of the characters, what they look like. If they had a cut on their face, you're matching to that. The DP is matching the lighting. If it's a different DP, he's looking at it going, now oh, clearly it's a blue source light here. Uh, and it's really a testimony to how good the DP and the production designer are and the makeup crew of whether you can tell what was reshoot and what was sh- you know what was shot later on. I mean, obviously the times when you can watch movies and say, that person's hair is longer or, you know, that person doesn't look the same, but um, it's, it's, it's quite fun sometimes to watch a movie that you've worked on where, you know, you shot something a year later and go, that's reshoot. That's original footage. That's reshoot. That's reshoot. That's reshoot. That was shot in June. Look, the sky's a different color there, you know, and uh, you know, well, that's Canada. That's actually back in Los Angeles. That's in Canada. That's in Louisiana. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because you can, a good editor can just put it all together. Um, but it really comes down to the material that you've got before. And like I say, it's a case of studying the original cut or the cut that you're working to, to make sure everything matches. Yeah. It's, it's interesting too, because I think it shows how much of a collaborative effort films are. I mean, of course the director is very important, but you know, it, it's not just the director. It's not just the actors. I do think the crew deserves a lot of credit. You know, you need a good editor, you need good makeup effects. And if one part of it falls apart, then that can jeopardize the whole movie. No, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, the director's job is, you know, the the head of the creative team. So, I mean, I think you can push your crew and uh, a good director will get the very best out of his crew. uh, And it's down to the director to have a vision. But yeah, you're, you, you know, you are relying on people and people let you down. I mean, there are times when you're sitting in the edit room looking at something going, you know, look, that person, you know, in the first scene, that person's hair like this, and the next scene, the person's hair like this, you know. So the makeup person didn't do a good job and the continuity girl didn't, the person didn't spot it, you know what I mean? Like, so there are times when they let you down or the DP has lit something wrong or anything else. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, and I think there are films you work on where people do exceptional jobs and work brilliantly well and you say, I'm going to use that person again if I can, and then the people do let you down. Uh, it's like anything, it's... It's trial and error. I mean, when you are hot on a film, whether it's a low budget film and you've got 40 or 50 people working with you or a very, very high budget film with hundreds of people, um, it's, it's, it, it falls on anyone. It, it, right down to 
how good the PAs are and how good the craft services and the food is. You know what I mean? I mean, you get lousy food on a film and the crew lose, uh, you know, it, the crew are miserable, you know. Um, it, it's like, you know, it, it's absolutely everyone is very valuable. There's not a person who's there who isn't uh, valid. Now, when it, when it comes to all the different um, credits, like, for instance, so you did the additional makeup effects for Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. Then fast forward to 2002, Halloween Resurrection, you're credited, at least on IMDb, and IMDb is not always right, but uh, you're credited as special makeup effects creator. And in some, you're uh, credited as makeup effects artist. What's the difference between all these different uh, credits uh well if you're an artist i mean i was if, if i have any control over the credit i'm doing it for instance like um i mean people will say to me oh you know i hear you worked on you know x-men uh, wolverine and i'm like i did one day on it you know i came in and applied a makeup for somebody you know all i did was come in they gave me some appliances and i applied them so i was a makeup artist that day that's all i did if you're a makeup designer or a creator then you're designing and building the effects in the in the film uh, you know, you're the person behind them. Um, so for something like Hellraiser, those movies, I designed and my team built under my direction the creatures, you know. So like I designed Angelique Cenobite and the Stitch Cenobite and the Wire Twins and all that. They're, they're my designs. Uh, whereas if I'm working for on Heroes or on uh, Sleepy Hollow, I was working for Kevin Yeager. I mean, I was the workshop supervisor. So again, uh, I was collaborating on some of the ideas that I thought we could do, which is my job. You know, how should we do this? And Kevin would say, I want to do it this way. And I'd say, have you thought about this? And Kevin would say, yes or no, or get stuff, Gary. That's a terrible idea. You know, I mean, um, so it really depends where on the totem you are. But if you're the Mac Perfect designer, you're at the top of the ladder, you know. So, um, you so know. On, on a movie like Halloween Resurrection, that's not like a creature heavy movie. What would you be designing in that? Assuming that it, you were the, the makeup effects designer for that one, right? Well, yeah, yeah. So I was designing the kills, you know, on that situation. It was like, I mean, the kills were written down in a certain way, but then I was designing the prosthetics or designing the, uh, you know, basically the kills, like, and, and discussing the kills, how we were going to do it. It's like, uh, do you want to do it this way or do you want to do it that way? And then whatever we were going to build. The only thing I didn't do on that was the Michael Myers mask, um, which was built by, I can't remember, it was built by a mask company. And it was the first time I met Mustafa Ricard because they bought the mask in and were trying it on the actor on the day. And I was sitting there and they were going, it's too long here. And this is too long. And the hair's too long and it doesn't look right. And they looked at me and I went, and I went, oh, I didn't make it. What were you looking at me for? Well, you're the makeup first designer. I said, yeah, but I asked you if I was going to build the mask. And you said, no, 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 you were going to have it done. I said, so now you want me to fix it? I was like, that's bullshit. You know what I mean? I'm going to a bit of a, a bit of a fight with Mustafa Ricard about that. Cause I was like, I told you it was wrong when I saw it. I said, I said, I'd make it for you, but you wanted to have somebody else do it. I said, so now you've got it. So I deal with it. And then years later, the same thing happened on the Scream TV show. I got pulled in to do an effect on Scream, the TV show. And the mask was there. And, and they said, Bob Weinstein's coming over to look at the mask. And I said, well, I'm going to leave. And they were like, no, 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 we need you here. And I said, oh, I didn't make the fucking mask. I said, no, you deal with it. I said, I asked you if you wanted me to make it. And I said, you said you didn't want me to make it. I said, so now you want me to fucking fix it? You want me to polish someone else's turd? I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, you can tell Bob, you know, get stuffed. And Bob came in and we had a big joke about it. You know, he's like, oh, you know, I need you to help me out. But um, so, yeah, on on uh, whilst something like Halloween Resurrection wouldn't seem like, you know, you're designing a big creature or monsters or uh, elaborate makeup effects, you're still designing. So, I mean, um, really, it's just a title at that point. But, yeah, I was in charge of building everything for, you know, whether it was the the rats that Michael Myers was eating that or the various kills. Again, it's been a long time since I did uh, Halloween uh, Resurrection. Although yeah. I am in it and I get killed as well. That's the great thing about Halloween Resurrection. I'm actually in it twice. That's the funny thing. I'm the paramedic who gets his head, you know, cut off, you know, and cr my larynx crushed, wearing a very bad moustache. And then if you ever watch it, there's a scene where they go to the house of the kids and a clown jumps down in front of the camera. And I'm that clown as well. So, so I, I got to ask, Bob Weinstein, I have heard some crazy stories about Bob Weinstein and what he expects of people in the uh -huh. sense that uh, for like Halloween 6, he was like, well, what we need is we need more gore and there needs to be like a sci-fi 
plot to it. Like have have them have a, a DNA thing that they want to get from Michael uh, and add this, this, and this. Uh, is that Bob Weinstein in a nutshell? More explosions. <laughs> Uh, Bob is a character. I'll say that. He's a character. Um, how do you describe Bob? What's really funny is everyone who's worked with has a Bob Weinstein impression. That's what's really funny. Everyone does like an impression of him. So when Bob leaves, everyone will do this impression or, um, you know, <laughs> we need more fucking blood. You know, I mean, he's definitely a kind of, he's definitely a throwback to that old kind of, you know, what you'd kind of consider classic producer. Of you know what we need is this, god damn it, you know. Um, trailer shots, that's what always Bob used to really want. But yeah, he's definitely kind of a barking kind of like this needs to happen, we need to get it done, and someone needs to fix it right now. Um, which is very awkward for me because I remember vividly being on Scary Movie uh five, and there was a scene where they needed this wig to come to life and it needed to crawl along the floor, and we had no production time. And I remember there's a big meeting where I'm like, you know, you're me in the room, and Bob's here and he's going. And there's like six people, visual effects people, special effects and all that. And he's like, look, somebody needs to figure this out. Somebody needs to figure this out right now. And they're going to figure out how to do this. We have a problem. It's going to cost too much money. But there's one person who can probably figure this out. And he kept just kept coming back to me. And he kept saying, so so somebody needs to figure this out. Uh, and then they'll, I'm sure they'll come up with an idea and they'll figure it out. And and then he left and everyone looked at me and went, so I guess you're going to figure this out, Gary. And I was like, I guess I am. And I went home and figured it out. So, um yeah, Bob, uh, Bob's definitely a character. And I, I've definitely seen him drive people around the bend. I mean, the, the problem is that, um, yeah, Bob was always very short and sharp and to the point. And there were times when <laughs> I would see Bob on a film, you know, six months and Bob would be like, hey, Donny Cliff, how are you doing? And then I'd see him later, you know, another six months later, he just walked straight past me, wouldn't say a word. And I remember getting very huffy to a, an executive at Dimension saying, Fucking Bob Weinstein, you know, he doesn't even know who I am. He didn't say anything to me yesterday. And he said, well, I've worked with him for six for six years. He said he still doesn't talk to me some days. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, but when I did Hellraiser Judgment um, and we finished the film, I got a phone call directly from Bob, you know, actually from Bob. I'll never forget it. I was driving to Anaheim and the phone rang and I, I was like, hello, Gary Tunnicliffe. And this woman said, you know, I have Bob Weinstein for you on the other line. I was like, what? And I picked up the phone and so I was like, Hello, Bob. And he was like, Tony Cliff, I just wanted to say, I just saw Hellraiser Judgment. How did you do it for that money? How did you do this? It's fucking brilliant. I'm blown away that you did this for the money. And I was like, yeah, you should have hired me years ago, right? And he was like, ha, 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 fuck you. You know, but yeah, definitely a character. Some people do not like Bob and uh, I've got problems with him. Obviously, Guillermo del Toro has said that he hated working for the Weinsteins uh, when he did Mimic. Um, but Miramax but, uh, has gotten a lot of things done i mean regardless what people think of the harvey weinstein stuff i mean miramax has got films made yeah harvey wasn't bob you know um and we always we it was kind of funny because for years it was said that um dimension which was ran by bob weinstein uh pays for the you know we were the we were the guys that made all of these sequels that always turned a profit so that Miramax, which was run by Harvey, could make these Oscar movies, you know what I mean, that didn't really make any money, but got all the awards. But the thing that was funding that was Dimension Films making all of these sequels, making all of these horror movies. Um, and I don't know. I mean, uh, I can't be, I can't, I, I, I've got no malice towards Bob. I mean, I, I have a very nice house and had a very nice life, thanks to the Miramax guys and to and to those guys rehiring me again and again and again. Was it difficult? Were they, did they test your sanity? Yeah, absolutely. But I've said this in other meetings. I always used to describe it like um, a lion tamer who, who works in a circus and has an act every night where he puts his head inside the lion's mouth. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, one night the lion's going to try and bite your head off, right? It's going to happen one night. So all you can do is be prepared and have all of your, senses ready for when the lion takes a bite out of your head and it happened a couple of times where they wanted to bite my head off but i tried to prepare i never was um i never took for granted that my job was secure i always tried to do the very best job i was never like oh this is my 10th film for those guys i'm sure they're gonna you know i can screw up and do whatever uh, i was very aware that there are plenty of other makeup effects guys in hollywood they can go to um and that i was nothing special so if they gave me a job i was very happy if they passed on me and went to someone else i was like oh, no hard feeling you know uh, it's show business, not so no friends, but 
I was never, you know, I never, I was never treated horribly by Bob, and uh, and I was given an opportunity to direct a film. So it sounds um, like he could be fun in ways too. I know there's this story you have about, uh, you know, you played the character of the auditor in yes. Hellraiser Judgment, and he asked you, "Oh, who's playing him?" Uh, maybe you can relate that little story. <laughs> Again, it was on the phone call when he called me and said, congratulations, you know, like, I really like the film. And and me, chanting my arm, I said, what did you think of the auditor guy? And he said, I fucking love that guy. He said, I love that guy. He said, I could listen to him talk for hours. He said, who played that? And I went, it was me, Bob. And he went, what? And he went, hold, and he went, hold on. And he kind of, I heard him put the hand over the phone. He's like, you know, the guy with the cuts on his face? That was Tunnicliffe. You know? I mean, what was really terrible for me, of course, what was really very depressing was the fact that Bob said to me, look, we're going to finish this movie, but then we'll talk about something in the future, you know, and uh, we'll get you a shot, you know. And months later, the whole Harvey Weinstein thing brought the uh, brought the company down to the ground. So um, I definitely, you know, feel like had that not happened, I'd probably been directing maybe a sequel to Hellraiser Judgment or uh, something else for, for Bob, you know. So, um, yeah. Definitely a kind, of, a kind of, for me, a, a bittersweet. Obviously, you know, I, you know, talking about Harvey Weinstein, the truth of the matter is, is that people knew what was going on for a long, long time. Do you know what I mean? A long, long time. And people who say they didn't, and it was all, oh, I never knew anything going on. You know, I mean, you know, we'd heard stories that Harvey was a bit of a creepy character uh, and was pretty hardcore to guys as well as as people. I mean, I always remember seeing... Um, and no one's ever bought this up recently, but if you watched Entourage, do you remember Entourage, the TV yeah. show? There was a character called Harvey in that, you know. And it was a, a, a large screaming man who would yell at people and be kind of like belligerent. I was like, well, it's no, no, you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's written about in a TV show, clearly everybody knows this is. Well, speaking of, of Hellraiser, just as a franchise, you start working on pretty much all the Hellraisers after the second one, right? You're, you yeah. you start with the third one, Hell on Earth. Uh, were you always a Hellraiser fan? Oh, huge, huge Hellraiser fan. I was a Clyde Barker fan before that. I mean, I'd read the books of Blood and, uh, and Weave World and loved Clyde's work um, and really wanted to go and work at Image Animation because I remember vividly watching, you know, Hellraiser and seeing Pinhead on screen and going, you know, who did that? That's amazing. I'd like to do that. Um, so my my sole agenda was to get to work on a Hellraiser film. I, mean, I think my three kind of like bucket list wishes were work on a Hellraiser film, work in Los Angeles, and work with Clyde Barker. And those three things happened all all in one week, uh, about a year into my you know start of my career. But initially, when I was uh, my initial job on Hellraiser three. I was just in charge of making the Hellraiser boxes. That was all I was doing. I was in charge of making the Hellraiser boxes. But as the production ensued, um, I ended up kind of being more of a workshop supervisor and kind of organizing the effects and making sure they were sent out. And and then we sent all the effects out to uh, North Carolina where they were being filmed. And while they were filming um, Hellraiser 3, I was building the effects for um, Candyman. Yeah, let, let's talk about Candyman for a second. I mean, what what was going on with that set? Were you around the bees and the stuff like that, or not on the first film? Again, I was in I was in uh, England building stuff and sending it out. So actually, the effects were handled on set by um, Dave Keen, Mark Coulier, and Bob Keen. Um, but on the third film, I got to work directly with uh, Norman Gary, who did the first film as well. I think on the second film, he's the bee guy. Uh, and I was involved in putting bees on Tony and putting bees in his mouth and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, uh, strange thing working with those bees. Very, very strange. Um, and we would use juvenile bees for the stuff on his face and on him because the juvenile stings haven't yet matured. So when they try and sting you, they just bend. Um, but Norman would come to the location, would literally build a couple of hives and then all the bees would be there. And then he would bring the bees over release them onto people onto the set and then they would all fly back they would all just head back to the hives um and i never got stung tony got stung several times um but grip and electric guys got stung all the time because the bees would get lost inside the electric equipment and they would have to reach in and grab things and bees would get burned on the lights all the time you'd hear bees popping and fizzing on the lights all the time but um 
we knew when we were making Candyman that it was going to be a special film. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was very cool when it came out. Um, but I was the person who made the hook and all that kind of stuff. You know, so. you know, the thing that fascinates me about those Clive Barker movies and, and his stories is, you know, when you, when you watch a movie like Hellraiser, you may, I don't know if you'll agree or disagree with this, but when I saw Hellraiser for the first time, I thought it was going to be uh, all about, you know, oh, Pinhead is the villain. So Pinhead yeah. is actually a really neutral character. So are the Cenobites. The villains are actually these really human evil beings. human characters. Yeah, of course. No, that's what's genius about Clive. Um, I think it's a very, uh, and that's why it's it's a story that's lasted for so long. Is because essentially it's a love triangle story. You know what I mean? I mean, it's really a, it's a story between Julia, Larry, and uh, and Frank, um, and Kirsty. You know, and uh, you know the Cenobites are the icing on the cake kind of thing. Um, they're like referees almost yeah um i've always said that it's essentially uh to me uh and maybe i'm wrong but to me it's actually a mob story it's completely it's a mob story so if you think about it in terms of if you if you if you said okay i'm going to describe to you as a mob story you've got this guy who basically robbed you know stolen from the mob you know and has escaped and turns up at you know his ex-lover's house and says they're going to come and find me. You know, you've got to protect me. I need you to help me, help me, help me. And she's like, okay, I help you. I had an affair with you behind my brother's back. I'm going to hide you in the attic. And when these henchmen come to try and find you, I'm going to protect you. You know what I mean? And that's really all it is. And the henchmen are the Cenobites, you know, so really he's just on the lamb. And he's basically saying to this girl, look, you help me out. And then me and you all run away together. But clearly he's got no, he's got, actually, he's not really going to do that. He's going to turn on her as well and turn her in. Um, so that's really why it works. It's in the same way that Star Wars is this kind of classic buccaneers tale. Um, you know, it's a very linear story. Uh, Hellraiser is the same, and that's why it works so well. Because what Clive has done in the same way that Tarantino does these things so brilliantly, he's turned it on its head, you know what I mean? Uh, and it's like, what if? What if it wasn't, you know? That's why I was talking about. It was, I mean, a film that I worked on that didn't do very well, which is, but I think is a great idea, is Drive Angry. You know, I love I love the fact that you go, oh, this is a guy who's trying to basically find his daughter's killer and bring, you know, bring him to justice and save his baby. And he's escaped from jail. No, he hasn't escaped from jail. He's escaped from hell. What? Yeah, he was actually he's dead. And he's he's actually, you know, 75 years old and he escaped, he's escaped from hell, you know, and he's now being hunted down by, uh, you know, an emissary of Satan. You know, I'm like that's a great idea to me. Patrick Lussier, who I did Dracula 2000 with and Drive Angry. Yes, I mean, you've done multiple films with Patrick. I think you did yeah. Treat, Trick, right, as well, recently. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But Patrick has brilliant concepts. I mean, Dracula 2000, to me, a, a, a massively overlooked film. To me, that's one of the best concepts for a movie ever. The idea that Dracula is Judas Iscariot, to me, that's, that's fucking genius. That's absolute genius. When I read that for the first time, I was like, this is brilliant. It makes perfect sense. It's a really, really great mythology. And Patrick's brilliant at that kind of thing. He, you know, whether you like Terminator Genesis or whether you don't, the concept for the opening sequence is a very clever idea. And that was Patrick, you know. Yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting too. Would that have been one of the other Halloween films that you would have worked on? Because I know he worked on a script for Halloween 3 that was going to be a sequel to the zombie movie. Halloween 3, 3, 3, 3D, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. We were We were weeks away from shooting. We'd actually started building things. And, uh, you know, we were ready to go and start shooting in uh, Louisiana. Yeah, and I got called from Patrick and he said, stop, it's gone dead. So I was going to do that one. And then uh, the last Halloween, the most recent one, um, they, they'd got the deal. Malik, well, first of all, Malik called me and they were doing actually, before that film went to Blumhouse, they were going to be doing a sequel with the Weinstein Company, you know, with Dimension. And um, we were supposed to be going to, God, we were going to shoot it in Utah at one point, and then we were going to go to Serbia to shoot it, and the budget was coming down, but we'd, we'd broken down the script. I was doing the effects. I was having conversations with Malik, and then that went bump. And then all of a sudden, this new script came up with Blumhouse, and they called me and said, we want a budget from you. And I was working with Malik and Sean Gary, the producer on it, and then they said, you know what, Blumhouse want to use their makeup effects artist, which is Chris Nelson. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, I understand. And then a few weeks later, they said, Chris Nelson's budget's too high. Can you do it for less? And I was like, yes. And they're like, can you fly back to LA tomorrow? And I was like, if I have to. And then a week later, they were like, no, don't bother. We think we figured it out. So 
it was stop and start for a little while, but I was very happy to see that uh, the film did as well as it did. I was shocked to see it did as well as it did. I didn't think people would give a damn, but um, you know, clearly it was, it's a it's a great idea and uh, and has reinvigorated the franchise again. Now, I wanted to get back to Hellraiser. I know you've talked about Hellraiser a million and one times. I almost feel like I want to talk about the other movies in a way. But uh, for my listeners that are not familiar with some of the effects that go into it, how long does it take to get all the makeup on Doug Bradley as Pinhead? Um, it's varied over the years. Um you know, the average time usually for a full prosthetic makeup is usually about uh, three hours, you know, um, and that's, you know, it's, that's skin preparation. That's a, you know, it was a three-part piece makeup, so the makeup would actually um, blend around here and across here. So that was one piece was the whole cow with all the pins, and all the pins are put in first. They're all attached before. Then there's a second piece that goes here, and then there's a third piece that's a lower lip, so three pieces. And to put that on, glue it all on, and then um, blend it all in and do his hands and all that kind of thing, put his eyes in his teeth, about two and a half, three hours. That got whittled down over the years to about two hours. And then there was a time on Hellraiser Bloodline when I had a bet we needed to get it done quickly, and I did it in one hour, 29 minutes and 27 seconds or something, and I got $20 off Doug for that as a gift. And then on the last movie I did with Doug, um, the producers have made a screw up and they said, look, we've screwed up. We need Doug in makeup as fast as you can possibly do it. And I said, Doug, if you're willing, I'm going to try and go for the world record, but I need you to sit perfectly still. And he said, okay. And he sat there like a rock. He was brilliant. He just sat there like a rock. And I did the makeup uh, in uh, 69 minutes. So it can be done very quickly, but generally for a, a brand new prosthetic makeup with breaks and normally you'd, you'd want about two and a half hours to glue it on and, uh, you know, to make sure it's going to be glued on properly. It's going to hold it for the day because it's like most prosthetic makeups, well, like all prosthetic makeups, the moment it looks its best is that when it's finished in the trailer, from that point on, it's degrading. It's starting to fall apart. You know, it's starting to break down around the mouth, around the eyes, all that kind of thing. So this is why makeup effects artists hate it at the end of the shooting day, 12 hours into shooting, they want to do close-ups around the eyes, around the mouth. That's why when you see a, you know, you might see a movie from the 90s or the 80s and look and say, oh, you can see the lines on that guy's mouth. I'm sure there's a makeup artist watching that scene going, yeah, they shot that at two o'clock in the morning and he'd been wearing it all day and he'd eaten lunch and he'd had soup and he'd eaten, you know, pieces of melon and God knows what. And, uh, yeah, I was trying to make it work, but, you know, then they put the camera here, you know. and So it, it happens all the time. These days, you know, you're digitally, a little bit of digital cleanup to make it look perfect, but... Uh, Back in the days of pre-digital, you know, you would be trying to make sure edges look good. And sometimes uh, an actor like Doug would really take care of the makeup. But, you know, I've literally applied makeups to people and then turn around and they're eating a, a barbecue rib, you know, and looking at me like, what? And you're like, there's barbecue sauce all over this beautiful prosthetic makeup you've just applied. And you're like, what are you doing? You know, never mind having to battle if you're shooting in a very hot location or the actor's sweating like a pig or the actor's an alcoholic and he didn't tell you so the pieces won't stick to his skin because he's got so much alcohol coming out of his skin. I mean, that's really the job of a makeup artist is you're trying to maintain something that is degrading from the moment it's applied. The reason I asked specifically about how long it would take is I had uh, Linnea Quigley on my show recently and she told me about, you know, working... Uh, on the set of Night of the Demons, Steve Johnson, of course, did the effects for that. And she said it was just awful having the makeup applied to her. She's like, I was crying. I could not take it anymore. Have you ever had issues with actors? <laughs> Maybe not like freaking out like that, but where they can slow things down in a way or it's just difficult. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I've had people, I mean, what's always amazing is when you, you do a makeup on somebody and they're like, wow, I didn't think it was going to be like this. You know, like I wasn't expecting this. And you're like, it says in the script, you know, you, you know, the horribly, horribly decayed corpse of so and so, and they're like, oh yeah, I didn't, but I didn't think I was going to look like this. Um, I mean, usually, what I would always do if I was if I was going to be applying a makeup for someone more than three days, I would say to the person when I first met them, "I'm hi, I'm Gary. You're gonna you're gonna hate my guts." And they're like, "No, no, I'm really excited for it." And I go, "Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you are." And day one, you're going to love it. 
Day two, you're going to like it less. By day three, you're going to start to hate it. I mean, it is. It's a very invasive process, and it's not fun. I mean, this is why makeup effects will go by the wayside eventually and be taken over by a digital technology, because it's 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 incre- it's an analog it's a it's an analog, an analog technology in a digital world. You know, taking an actor away for three hours to glue shit all over them and then have to bring them back at the end of the day and remove it, it's a pain in the butt, you know. Um, so even the most patient of people will find it's a bit, you know, I mean, even if you just said, I'm, I want you to sit in a chair for three hours while I just do this to you, you know, you're going to go, well, that's going to get really annoying after a little while. But that's exactly what's happening. You're sitting in a chair. You can't really read. You can't really eat while someone's poking at your face and gluing to you and, you know, sticking stuff to you and it can feel very claustrophobic. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, um, I've been very lucky in that I've, I've, I've had people, I've had people get miserable with it and you try and console them and you have to be a bit of a psychologist and you definitely feel people's energy come out. Like I want to get this shit off as soon as I can. Um, I've had bigger reactions from people getting blood on them where they get blood, they're covered in blood and they tend to get very annoyed by that. You know, uh, and I, again, I understand it. You know, it's cold, it's wet, it can be miserable, it's sticky. Um, you know, but it's like, uh, you know, I mean, you read the script, right? I mean, it did say that this was going to happen. It's, you know, um, it's part and parcel of the of the business, really. Um, so you, you, you ever have uh, actors say like, Oh, I, I I need a cigarette breaker. You know, they try to like get out of it for a, a minute or two. Oh well, Doug Bradley was a master of that. You know, Doug <laughs> Bradley, the king of, you know, I mean, I think towards the end of wearing the, of, of having to put the pinhead bank up on, he, you definitely felt the, you know, like he turned up to set, he'd be laughing and joking, having the cigarette, drinking a cup of coffee, and then I'm kind of standing there looking at him and looking at my watch, and he's like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I'm just gonna finish this cigarette, and then I'll be with you in a second, Gary. I know we need to get going, and you'd be like. Yeah, Doug, you know, you know, really. And he just he just didn't want to get in the chair. And I understand it, you know. And he'd even say, Oh, okay, here we go. Let's do this thing. You know what I mean? It was definitely a, a bit of a, a burden. And I understand it, you know. It's like yeah, he's worn it over a hundred times and it's you know, it's it's takes the energy. I mean, I'm a bit like, yeah, I've applied it 66 times. Trust me, I'm not in a, I'm not in a hurry to do it either, you know. Um necessary evil right you know you've got to do it but i mean uh, yeah he definitely i need a break can can i go and relax for five minutes or you know get out of the chair um i think all actors like that again it's like uh you know i mean i think people have heard the various stories of actors who've been driven crazy by i think notoriously uh jim carrey wearing the grinch makeup on uh the grinch movie it drove him to the point of insanity you know and i can understand why i mean not only is it full prosthetic makeup and a very, very attentive makeup artist like Kazu, but you're also wearing a yak hair suit, which is awful. I mean, uh, I mean, funnily enough, you'll hear people complain about prosthetic makeups, but probably equally and probably more famously, you'll see actors complain about wearing fake beards and fake mustaches. Because, I mean, uh, you know, I think anyone who's ever had a fake moustache where it's tickling your nose, it's very, very annoying. So anything glued to your face is uh, is a bit a bit tiresome after a little while, I think. Uh, but I've been, but I've, I've been lucky. I've um, I've never had anyone have a full-on meltdown. Do you remember this, the skinned girl on uh, Hellraiser 3? There's a girl who gets sucked into the pillar and she's skinned, a lovely actress called Jill Kershaw. I do remember her sitting on the stage and crying and her tears running down the down, on the foam latex suit because she was just mis- she was tired and she was miserable and and uh, you know she just wanted to go home and it had been a long day. They had to shoot her for a long day with her and I kept her waiting and I just remember sitting there crying and kind of I went and put my arm around her and put like a coat around her to try and keep her warm. So you do feel very bad sometimes because you feel like you're the person who put them in this situation where you're the one who is, is make, making them miserable because you had to pile this stuff to them. Um, but yeah, I've never had anyone. Ever. I mean, I, I did hear a classic story. The classic story was about um, Terrence Stamp on a film called Alien Nation. I don't uh, remember. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard this story that there was a story that went around Hollywood for a while where Terry Stamp just couldn't stand to wear the makeup. He just hated it. He just absolutely hated it. Never wanted to wear it ever again and didn't want to wear it. And there was a story that I'd heard from somebody where Terrence Stamp was in the makeup trailer crying, going, I can't do it. I can't wear this fucking makeup. I don't want to wear it. And Gail and Heard was yelling at him, $250,000, Terrence. That's how much we're paying you. Put the goddamn makeup on, Terrence. Put the goddamn makeup on. He was like, I can't wear it. I can't wear it. 
And I worked with Galen Hurd a few years a few years ago, and uh, for her husband Jonathan Hensley, and we're actually shooting at their house in her in her boat house by her pool. And that's the only reason I went and agreed to do it. A friend of mine was doing some makeup effects on a little film that Jonathan Hensley was directing, Galen Hurd producing, and he said, "Will you come and help? We're shooting at Galen Hurd's house." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I'll help." Not because I wanted to do the makeup, but I wanted to go to Gal and Hurd's house. So I ended up applying this makeup and Gal and Hurd came in and she was kind of curious and she was chatting away. And I said, I have to ask you a question. I said, I heard a story about you and Terrence Stamp on Alien Nation where he was crying that he didn't want to wear the makeup and you were screaming at him, $250,000, Terrence, that I brought up paying you. I said, is that true? And she went, yeah, probably. <laughs> She's like, probably, yeah, probably. Sounds, sounds possible. She said, yeah, I could have probably been screaming that. Might have happened. You, met, so, you mentioned briefly that, you know, sometimes you may have to console an actor when they're just, it's too much for them. Like, what, what would your tip be to someone that's working in makeup effects, uh, the few that are left, uh, and, and they have an actor that's just like, oh, I can't do this. I'm too claustrophobic. The few that are left. No, I mean, look, makeup effects isn't that, that, it isn't that. Okay, it's, it's not going extinct yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> um. Look, I mean, I've I've definitely learned a few tricks over the years to deal not to, to helping. I mean, I think really it comes down to anything. It's like um, if you can find out what people's favorite music is and have that standing by in the in the in the trailer. People when they come in the in the morning, you know, like five o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning, they're miserable and it's cold and they don't have a makeup put on. If you most times, if you play music that people really, really love, if you can find out what it is their favorite music is in the whole world and have that playing when they come in, most people tend to feel, you know, it changes their mood. So good music can really, really help. Sometimes stepping away and leaving them alone and not trying to bug them for a while, uh, you know, uh, keeping them informed, just really. <sighs> Sometimes you have to step away from the fact that, you know, uh, sometimes makeup artists are very all about the makeup. Like, this is my creation. It's my makeup. And I want it to look really, really brilliant and fuck the human being in it. And sometimes you have to really, really care about the person inside. And I think makeup, most makeup artists do. And I think really good makeup artists, um, the actor knows that they're there for them. So, I mean, I think whether it's just going to get them a cup of coffee or something or making sure they get their favorite snack or something like that. Sometimes that goes a long way. Uh, again, you know, I mean, think about yourself or think about anyone, you know, I mean, if you've, if you've got a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or someone who's in a bad mood, if you put their favorite music on and bring them their favorite cookies or favorite candies, people will eventually start to, you know, oh, things aren't so bad, you know what I mean? You know, and I've found that over the years that if you do that and you go, look, I've spoken to the, you know, I've even gone to the ADs and said, look, this person's having a really tough time today. You've barely shot with them. They've been in this makeup all day long. Do you really, you know, are they, are they, are you going to finish with them tonight? And I've had ADs go, you know what, hold on a second. You know what? I think we're done with them. You can probably let them go. And if you go to the person and say, Hey, I've just spoken to the ADs. We're going to wrap you now. And they go, really? We can leave. And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they realize that had you not done that, they'd still have to wear it for another three hours. Um, they they appreciate that. That's all you can do, I think. I mean, look, some people are going to be miserable no matter what, and maybe there's something else to it. But I think most people wearing a prosthetic makeup who are having a hard time with it realize it's not your fault. Um, and and people who are really considerate tend to know as well that most makeup artists, for them, once they remove the makeup and the actor leaves, their day's not finished. You know, my job could be to complete doing other effects or I then have to clean the makeup trailer up and get ready for the next makeup I'm going to do or prepare the makeup for the very next day. So I have had actors who've literally come in the next day and said, I'm sorry, I was in such a bad mood yesterday. I know that you were here four hours after I left and you were here two hours earlier this morning before I got in. So I'm sorry I moaned. John, Johnny Johnny Depp actually did that. I barely worked on Johnny on um, Sleepy Hollow, but I did work with him a lot and we, we actually kind of knew it, you know, he knew who I was and I knew who he was, obviously. Uh, but I had to apply makeup on him one day and uh, I came in and I was like, hey, Johnny, how are you? And he was like, oh, honestly, he said, I'm, I'm tired, man. I'm tired. He said, I'm tired and it's cold and I don't really like being here and I miss my house and, you know, I, uh, and I'm only getting paid $7 million. <laughs> and he looked at me and he went, I'm being a big pussy, aren't I? And I was like, well, he's like, no, I'm sorry, man. He said, I'm sorry. He said, no, I'm good. I'm good. 
go ahead and do whatever you got to do. So I'm sorry, I'm being such a whiny bitch, you know, and he, he recognized it, but he was really funny about it. You know, it's like, yeah, poor me. I'm only getting paid this much money, you know. Um, but again, it's like, you know, it's, you know, it's like anything. Is there is there ever, you know, awkward moments doing makeup? I know Steve Johnson had to work on Linnea Quigley's uh, boobs in Night of the Living Dead. Uh, I assume that when you're working in that close vicinity to people, ultimately you're just so focused on the work that it doesn't even feel awkward, maybe? No, that's not true at all. Have you seen Piranha 3 Double D? I love Piranha 3 Double D. I, I love what you did with the uh, effects there. So, you know, there's a scene with a fish up, up a gentleman's ass. I had to stick a fish up that guy's ass. Trust me. I mean, literally. And we, I'd made this thing. So it was, I mean, I'm going to draw it for you in the basic way to explain what it was. It was really an arrow in the head guy. An arrow, you know, like the old arrow in the head. So it's like an arrow like that with a wire on it. So my fish up the ass gag was something very similar. Um, so my, 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 it was like, can you see that? So that was really the gag, you know? And like, if you can imagine, yeah. that's where the legs and the ass would go there, you know? So he would hold this thing and have to, and then I would have to push that. It was on a literally a piece of like wire that was very flexible. So then I can't remember his actor's name. Really, really funny guy, lovely guy. So, I mean, it came down to the moment and I was like trying to give it to my, my assistants and going, okay, you need to go into the fish and the ass jag. And they're like, nah, you're, you're doing that one. I was like, fuck. So then he had to literally bend over and I had to wet. He held the thing between his legs and then I had to kind of push this thing in as deep as I could. And he was like, get deeper in there, buddy, get deeper in there. And then we had a, a, a monofilament line attached to the tail that I would flick around and look like it was flipping around. So, yeah, you know, I mean, there is nothing more embarrassing than to shove a fish up somebody's ass, you know. Or there's another makeup in that film where a guy walks out and he's got a piranha hanging off his penis. So for that, I had to make literally a fake penis with fake scrotum with a fish already attached to it that was hollow. And the guy in question shaved and he, I, I gave him the gag. He went in the other room and slipped it over his uh, his penis and came out and then I glued it down. So, yeah, it's, you know, people always assume it's really weird that, um, that um, you know, if you get to glue something to someone's breast, it's really, really cool and aren't you lucky and, wow, you know, I'm jealous of you. But this, the truth is there's no intimacy to it. It's not like there's a sexual moment going on between you that you can really, you know, it's uncomfortable for the actor, you know, it's uncomfortable for you. Um, you know, there's no, there's no great, you know, like sexual chemistry going on. Although actually I, I take that back actually. Yeah. I have to take that back. I'll tell you another story in a second, but yeah, I take that back. There can be. So usually it's pretty uncomfortable and pretty weird. Yeah, absolutely. Um, two funny stories. One is um, Jerry Ryan, who was seven of nine in the Star Trek series, uh, was in Dracula 2000. Jerry's lovely, very sexy, very voluptuous. And we had a gag where she gets stabbed in the chest with a, you know, with a cross right here. So um, she actually came to my studio. We took a cast of her chest. Uh, I had to put nipple coverings on. We cast the middle of her chest and we made this special thing that could sit in her chest on a harness and would sit right in her breast. And then we would slide on this cross and it would look like she'd been stabbed. So I'd met Jerry. I did this cast on her. We laughed about it, giggled. She's very funny, beautiful person, really funny, very unabashed about the whole thing. And then I didn't see her for like three months until we actually filmed the effect on set. So I'm on set in New Orleans and Jerry Ryan comes to visit the set and Tony Steinberg, the first AD, says, Gary, Gary, this is Jerry Ryan. She's playing so-and-so. And Jerry Ryan went, oh, she said, I know Gary. Gary's been places that only a few men have been. <laughs> so that was really funny. So, but then a situation occurred on Drive Angry where uh, we had a bunch of cultists in a, in, a mood, in, the, in a scene where all these cultists were turning up and they're kind of like crazy Manson-esque cultists. And the call was put out to, for girls to be semi-naked or partially naked. And they got all these people. And uh, one girl in particular, we, we did um, 
really cuts on them. And there was a there was a sigil like a of the the cultist that we had to apply to people on their chin, on their arms, on their necks, on their things. And this one girl came to the set and she, and she came into the trailer and she was wearing like a, a robe. And I said, what are you wearing in the scene? And she said, I'm not wearing anything. And I was like, oh, you're naked. And she's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, OK. I said, where do you think we should put your tattoo? You know, your 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 thing. And she said, I think you should put it right here. And she literally had it applied, you know, about three inches above her vagina. So I applied this thing and uh, and she went away. And at the end of the night, she was kind of waiting. And I said, what are you waiting for? And she said, oh, I need to get taken off. And I was like, OK. And I was like, oh, one of the guys wouldn't take it off for you. And she's like, well, I wanted you to take it off. And I was like, oh, OK. And then the next night she came back again and she came straight to me and she said, I want you to apply my makeup again. And I had to apply it to her again in the same place. And she came back again the next night and she said, I'm not having to remove it but you. And by the third time I applied it, I realized there was something going on here. Like we'd crossed over the threshold of it just being a makeup artist and a makeup guy applying it. And there was a bit of chemistry going on. And that chemistry grew and grew and grew until we, we, uh, we had you do celebrated that chemistry. <laughs> I, I, I can dig that. I can dig that. Um, yeah. No, and it went on and became a, a true celebration of the chemistry of that. But it was one of those situations where she was literally like, well, you've seen everything and you've handled most of it. She said, we may as well just go to the next degree, right? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it did pay off in the end, I suppose. And she was very cute and it was awful. It was an awesome situation, but uh, I was very, she said, you were very professional for the first three times. She said, and I was literally, you know, she said, I was putting it out there very strong. And I was like, no, no, I was trying not to be a sick, creepy guy. And she's like, yeah, but you're cute. And I like you. And she said, and, uh, you know, so it was a weird situation, but, um, so that one time it did bear fruit. And obviously maybe that's what I'm with Steve Johnson and Lene quickly, maybe, you know, they just kind of fell in love on a film set, you know, so it happens. I mean, uh, Kevin Yeager and Catherine Hicks on Charles play, I guess. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Drive Angry because uh, I haven't seen all of Patrick's uh, films. I actually still need Good. to see Drive Angry, but I loved uh, My Bloody Valentine 3D. And I, I mean, I love the original, but some of the stuff you guys pulled off in that movie is just, oh, aces. I met Tom Atkins because I'm, I'm here in Pittsburgh and he so uh, he does a Christmas Carol play every year. Oh, really? and. It's interesting. Yeah, he plays Scrooge and he plays a, a football coach in another play. Um, but it's it's interesting. I went back to the theater after the show ended and I went and shaked his hand and I said, I love your horror movies. And uh, he said, which ones? Oh, Halloween 3, Night of the Creeps. And he says, kid, you know what you're going to love? My bloody Valentine 3D. It's coming out in a few months. So you get to see my jaw get ripped off. <laughs> How did you guys do that? <laughs> Well, what was really nice about look, I mean, Mother of Valentine was uh, was a great time anyway, and I do have to say, it's a terrible shame because a few days ago we actually lost the guy who played the miner, uh, Chris Carnell. He died in a, a motorcycle accident. He was a lovely guy. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible shame. But um, Todd Farmer and Patrick Lucier wrote uh, My Bloody Valentine, and they'd written certain various kills. But again, Patrick always tends to ask me what I think about kills and what can we do and we really tried to embrace the 3D nature of that film. We, you know, it was never like, oh, we're just shooting in 3D. It's like, let's really kind of like make it 3D, you know, and and make the kills that way. So when we talk about pulling the jaw off, so, I mean, uh, it was, uh, Patrick's just one of those guys who, uh, you know, embraces what I bring along and uh, love working with Patrick. There isn't anything I do, but like we were, we were shooting that in Pittsburgh and we were killing the one girl in a mine, for instance. And I said to Patrick, you know, we should do a homage to day of the dead here, you know, and originally the, the girl in the mine just supposed to get her head cut off. And I said, no, we should, we should stab her in the mouth with a shovel like that guy does in day of the dead, you know, and uh, we'll have a, a, her body drop away. So it's just things like that, you know, like people would probably wouldn't get the connection between Pittsburgh, day of the dead, Romero, and being in a mine shooting My Bloody Valentine, but that's what that was. It was a homage to Savini's work in Day of the Dead. Um, Tom, I mean, Tom is just, love Tom. I mean, uh, you know, I got to double Tom actually on uh, on Trick. I was his stunt double. Um, and we, we actually write to each other all the time. But uh, yeah, I think Patrick, if he could use Tom in every film, he would. I mean, he did My Bloody Valentine. He did um, 
drive angry and he just did trick so i mean uh yeah patrick to me is just one of those filmmakers who you know should be making marvel movies or should be making giant budget movies it's an absolute travesty he's not he's a brilliant filmmaker he's a lovely guy and he's a very very intelligent filmmaker especially because of his editing as well you know so uh yeah vastly underrated and underused director so g- give a little bit of insider knowledge here if if you can how do you pull off something like the the jaw ripping scene where you pull the whole jaw off uh Tom Atkins, or, or you make it look like that with movie magic. So, um, again, you break it down into cuts. So we knew what we need to see. So initially, the axe goes into um, under his, you know, we said we're going to have it so that the the axe will go under his neck and then the the tip of the pickaxe will come out of his... Uh-huh, yeah. So we made a plate on his teeth that could actually hold the tip of the pickaxe. So Tom would be walking around with the thing sticking out of his mouth like this. And then we had a, a rubber pickaxe with the end cut off it. So you held it here and it looked like it was coming out to the, to the mouth. So the initial part of the scene is that with um, the pickaxe being held here with piece sticking out of his mouth. Um, and then what we actually made was we made a fully mechanical fake head of Tom uh, in silicon, punched hair, great expression that the axe could fit through. And then the whole lower jaw could be ripped off and there was a blood pump inside that would spray blood out. And it could be refitted on with the magnets. There were magnets fitted into the piece. So to reshoot it, you could just slip the jaw back on and it would just pull off. So it's actually me just pulling the jaw off with a pickaxe. Um, and there was a little bit of CG work to have it fly towards the camera, but a lot of it is just practical. So it's just a mechanical, it's a fake head. We took a live cast of Tom in this expression, you know, made a fake head in silicon um, that had a blood pump inside it. Uh, the whole jaw could be re- re- removed and reattached. <laughs> All the hair work was punched one hair at a time by a brilliant hair artist called Denise Levy, um, or Denise Bear actually. And uh, yeah, it was just a good a good puppet head. So it was and, and good editing, really good editing. So making sure you get all of the elements, which were things like cutting back to the the you know a shot of the the miner pulling on the thing, and then Tom with the thing in his mouth, and then just a quick cut of pulling the whole jaw off. So that's how we did that. It was a mechanical. Head. Same thing for the. Um, the scene when Frank gets stabbed in the head with a pickaxe, you know, we had a, uh, a fake head of Todd that we could actually hit with a pickaxe. And then we had a makeup on Todd with a blood pump inside it that you could actually hold a pick on and it would look like it was buried into his head. It's really just sleight of hand. It's it's movie making sleight of hand. You know, it's, it's interesting, too, because uh, My Bloody Valentine was a 3D movie. Drive Angry was 3D. Piranha three double d was 3d are you like the guy that sometimes the studio will be like we need a 3d guy for makeup effects uh, for this 3d movie uh because it's a little bit different than the other movies that we do uh oh gary get him no i think i think i think all it was with patrick for, i think patrick was the 3d guy for a while i think because he'd done uh my little valentine 3d and it'd been so good he became the 3d guy for a while and and again i just i'm very lucky to be the uh you know, attached to that coach sometimes and get pulled along with it. He's um, sort of your go-to guy, yeah. If possible. You're, hey, his, you're his go-to guy, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, he very wonderfully described me as his horror muse <laughs> recently, you know, which is lovely. And uh, trust me, if I could only work for one director forever the rest of my life as a makeup effects person, it would be him. Uh, yeah, he's just he's just fantastic. Always have fun with him. He's very deviant. He's kind of a bit like Wes Craven in that. Wes I only did one film with Wes, but Wes had a very mischievous sense of humor and very, uh, you'd never expect such devious ideas to come from such a mild mannered guy. And Patrick's like that. He's soft spoken. He's very quiet. Yet he has this really, really mischievous kind of devious kind of sense of humor and uh, can come up with some really, really dark ideas that really surprised you. It's like, wow, where did that come from? Um, but just a nice guy and always available. Like you, you asked me, you know, have I ever had to solve problems, you know, on the fly? He's one of those directors who can do that where he doesn't, you know, he if you if they say, look, the truck didn't arrive that we need or the stunt people haven't turned up or, you know, that location is flooded. He can always come up with a way of figuring. He's brilliant at figuring things out like that and always very, very calm under pressure. I've never seen him barely ever, you know, lose it at all. A very, very calm guy. And that's why he's so nice to work with. Actors love him as well. Um, and shares information and welcomes information. I learned a lot on how to behave as a director from him. 
Um, well, you and him both, I don't, now you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think Patrick Lucier actually didn't start as, you know, just a director. I think he, did he do oh, DP work or director editor. of photography work? He was an editor. He was an editor. He actually started on MacGyver. Oh, wow. He was the editor of MacGyver. I well, believe. it's interesting because you both uh, have ended up in the director chair at times. Do you think prior experience has been useful? Uh, the wisdom of prior experience before directing? I think editors, especially my really good directors, because they tend to be quite uh, they they're much more economic with what they what they shoot because they know what they can they know how they're going to cut it in their heads. Whereas a lot of directors will just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, um, you know, because they're not exactly sure they're editing it. Whereas I think most editors and that's what I learned from Patrick was the art of the cut, you know. Um, from I mean. I don't think makeup effects artists tend to make very good directors, really, because they're not coming from a world of story. You know, um, again, editors are used to having to try and maintain the arc of a story and stuff like that. So they think about that. That's what I've really learned. I don't think why well, I'm a better director now than I was. You know, again, I'm always learning and trying to pick this up. But um, special effects people or makeup effects people tend to just think about special effects and makeup effects. You know, it's a bit like the classic thing of, you know, when I was in a band, you know, like, you'd listen to a, a, a mix done by somebody and go, was that a producer or a drummer? Because the drums sound really good and everything else that sounds like shit, you know? So I think sometimes with makeup effects people directing, you tend to get things where the makeup effects look very good, but the rest of it's a bit a bit piss poor. Um, so I've tried to make sure I don't do that. But what I've really learned more than anything else, but yeah, of course, I think uh, I would say that um, any time that, somebody's had a, a lengthy career in the film industry then it's going to benefit them whatever they whatever aspect of the job they go into but i definitely think as a director because even if it's just a situation where if you've done a hundred films i mean i said this a long time ago you know i never went to film school i just worked on a hundred films and i worked with rennie harley tim burton david fincher you know patrick lucier so i mean there's my I, film school i, I want to mention one more person in that because i think he's vastly underrated uh, is Joe Dante. And I know people don't consider uh, – what was the movie that you worked on him with? Burying the X. I know people don't consider it his highest point, but I think Joe Dante is a brilliant director. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No, he's an utter legend. I mean, that's why I wanted to work with him. I was very excited to do so. Um, yeah. No, I mean, Joe's – you know, I mean, I think, again, for somebody like me, you know, raised on makeup effects, I think anyone, you know – saw the howling and uh and the original piranha and stuff like that is clearly inspired by joe dante so i mean um yeah great honor to work with joe you know what's uh, the greatest trick you learned from you know whether it's joe dante or david fincher or one of these directors what's the greatest thing you maybe took with you when you did hellraiser judgment um not to put you on the hot seat, but <laughs> no, 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 no. The reason I the reason I laughed uh, is because I, I always remember the first time I directed a film back in 1996. I directed a science fiction film, and I called Clive Barker when I actually had Clive's phone number and could actually call him, and you know he would answer and talk to me. But I called Clive Barker and said, "Hey, Clive, I'm directing a film," and he was like, "Oh, great, Gary, excellent, have a great time." And I said, "Do you have any uh, you know tips? Can you give me a, a directing tip? You know." Is anything you like a word of wisdom you can share? And I was expecting him to say, you know, uh, think about your coverage or, you know, really examine the linear arc of your subjects or really try to make sure you don't use a deus ex machina or, you know, always give a good introduction to your lead character. And he just said, shoes, comfortable shoes. And I said, really? He said, yeah, we're, we're comfortable shoes. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of walking, man. <laughs> and it's true, you know, it is. Um, I mean, I think I think you you I think it's like anything. You you watch directors and you go, "We're not," you know. Again, Clyde Barker very smartly said, "He said never forget directing is the one job that everyone thinks they can do better than you," <laughs> which is true. Nobody ever looks at the craft service guy and goes, "You know, what? I can make better cheese tacos than that." You know, like, you know, I could do a better job than him. No one's ever looked at the makeup effects guy thinking, "Yeah, you know, I could spray blood better than him," but. Most people are looking at the director going, you know, I could do a better job than that. So I've always strived to be a director that they look at and go, wow, this guy's really, really good. Um, no, I mean, I think you learn different tips from different people. Um, you know, I didn't work with David Fincher for very long, but I mean, I had massive respect for him, uh, you know, and the few days that I did work with him, what I was impressed by was he doesn't leave the set. He doesn't wander off. He stays on the set and stays focused. So I try to do that. I don't, I don't wander off and, 
have a cup of coffee and kind of start chatting with people. I stay on the set and stay in the zone. And, and uh, I like to maintain the energy of that, to be there to answer questions. Um, from Patrick Lucio, I, I learned, try to be calm and cool and collected, you know. I mean, uh, from Stephen Norrington, you know, you, you try to think, okay, in this scene, what can I do that's different and what's cool and what aren't people expecting? So I think you, 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 you know, and then if you were with directors who you thought were assholes and did terrible things, you try not to do that. Um, so I think you you take you take whatever lessons you can from each people, you know, each person and whatever bit you like, and you go, oh, that's good, I like that. I'm going to use a bit of that in the future, or I don't like what he's doing there. Maybe I've done that and I shouldn't do it. You know, uh, you know, I've definitely sat on film sets. I mean, you know, so with some very very famous directors who I thought did did a terrible job. And whether it was the film I was working with them on and maybe I caught them at a bad time in their career, but I was like, what's all the brouhaha about this person? They're a pain in the ass or they don't seem to know what they're doing or they seem utterly confused by the whole situation. But maybe they're having a bad situation there on that particular film. So, um, I mean, what I would say is, it's, you know, it's, it's even on a low budget film, it's a lot of pressure. You're under a lot of pressure. And is it a very different experience? I, I assume it would be different working on Gone Girl than it would be Hellraiser Judgment. Food was better. That's for sure. <laughs> Food's always better. Uh, <clears throat> Gone Girl, I mean, that was a very intense sequence anyway. Fincher's set, when I worked with him, is unlike most films that you'll ever work on. It's the quietest film set I've ever worked on. There's only one voice you hear all the time, and it's David's. Uh, he knows exactly what he's doing. Um, he doesn't want any chit chat. He doesn't want people on their cell phones. He doesn't want people grazing at a craft service table. I think David's attitude is, and maybe it was, maybe it was just for these few days that we did that sequence. But what I got from David was, we're here to work, and I expect you to be here and on your game, doing your job from the moment we start to the moment we wrap. You know, um, I remember one day. I went, we, we broke for lunch and I went into the place to go and get food and the food was amazing. But I walked in and there was a, um, on the, on the menu, it said, you know, the dessert was like a white chocolate cream bread pudding with cream sauce. And as we walked in, David was leaving and he said, nobody eat that. He said, nobody eat the dessert. Nobody eat that dessert. Nobody. He said, I want you to actually take that dessert away. He said, I want people to actually be awake this afternoon you know what i mean we need to be awake and he was very aware that the food would put him into a coma somebody put a pad down for him to lean on on set and he said why is there a pad here he said pads are for relaxing we don't want any relaxing on set we're here to film um in terms of judgment i mean uh, when you're a director the, the thing is with being a director is you're directing 24 hours a day you know it's not like being a makeup artist where you kind of you apply your makeup and then you call rap and you clean up and you go home and you go to the bar and you have a few drinks if you're on location and hang out with some people and have a, a laugh and go to bed you know as a director you're just thinking about the next day and you're thinking did i get all my shots today and oh my god i forgot that and, uh what am i going to do tomorrow i need to get this done and da, 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 da. you just you you're carrying it for the whole production so i mean um it's it's one thing on a, a six-week shoot or a, a four-week shoot but on a six month shoot it's all you're doing day in and day out he's just thinking about the film and you've got people looking at dailies and questioning whether you're doing a good job and money people asking you where, 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 where we have a budget and can we do this and can we do that and you know you're just answering questions 99 percent of the time so so, so was was hellraiser judgment a, a longer shoot like i, I would assume it, it seemed like maybe it was done on a lower budget tighter production schedule no yeah. Three hundred and fifty thousand dollar budget. Wow. Yeah, crazy low. I mean, uh, I think we shot for four weeks, uh, four or five day weeks. I mean, um, yeah, very very small schedule. Um, <clears throat> we originally had four hundred thousand dollars in our budget, but the two weeks before, um, we were told we had to give fifty thousand dollars to Clive Barker for the rights or to his people. So when that was fifty thousand dollars taken out of my budget, and trust me, when you've got a four hundred thousand dollar budget, losing fifty thousand is a big deal um but i had a great crew and i was very well prepared very very well prepared uh again i mean you know, there are people who say that you know directing is like going into battle and that's not to detract from people who really go into battle something i could never do uh, far too cowardly and have nothing but utter respect for people who actually put their lives on the line and fight 
uh, you know, hand to hand or shooting people. But I mean, uh, you are guiding 40, 50, 60 people every day and giving them answers and trying to get what you need to get done in a day. Because the truth is, if you don't get it that day, you can't go back and get it again, not on a low budget production. You can on a high budget production, maybe, but. Uh, you know, that's why I feel for the people that on Bat- the Batman. You know what I mean? If they're getting shut down due to COVID or shut down to bad weather, it's it's it it's very testing on you. You know, it tends to leave people very wrought. And I can't imagine shooting under the the haze of a pandemic. It must be a nightmare. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. I've already talked to a few directors who are working through the pandemic, and I just I'm like, wow, that's got to yeah. be intense. Oh, I, saw a picture of, I saw a picture of Matt Reeves, you know, yesterday wearing like, you know, two masks and a face shield and a hat. And I was like, wow, what a pain in the ass. I, I'm supposed to be directing a film maybe next year. And I just said, look, can we not just wait until the vaccine's out? Because I just don't want to be in that world. I don't want to have to wait while they fog the set and whatever has to get tested. I need to shoot. You know, I mean, I, I want to be there to shoot, not to, you know, go through medical procedures every every hour and and how are we going to do love scenes or crowd scenes and stuff like that? I'd rather just wait until there's a vaccine and we can just shoot normally. Before closing out here, I have to hit on one more thing. You worked on a lot of creature effects. You've done the pumpkin head movies, Feast, uh, Piranha 3 Double D, we sort of covered. What's it like handling these? Oh, Mimic as well. Uh, what's it like handling these puppets? And uh, what goes into that? Any crazy stories uh, where things may go wrong or... Yeah, there's loads of crazy stories. I mean, how much time have you got? A Mimic was hard because it was physically quite demanding on me because <clears throat> for that, for Mimic 2 and Mimic 3, we built a puppet that was mounted above my head. So it was actually, um, you know, we had height. So it was a full mechanical torso that I was worn on a back rig. So I would control its arms with my own hands, but the puppet was extended up here. And that weighed about 65 pounds and I would have to wear that. So that was physically quite damaging. I'm actually having some back problems now, and I'm sure it's because of Mimic. Um, Feast, you know, uh, if you ever watch the making of that, you know, the on Project Greenlight, you, there's a scene where I'm underneath the Feast creature, and they we had sushi turn up one night when, when we were in the middle of filming, and everyone went off to go and get sushi, and I'm under the set holding the fucking creature, and all of a sudden it's like, why aren't we shooting? Why aren't we rolling? And people were going off to go and get sushi. And I was like, are we making a film or are we eating fucking sushi? What are we doing? Like, let's get the fucking film shot. Um, yeah, there are things that go wrong. Blood pumps, exp- I had a blood pump exploding on Candyman. We were doing a blood gag where I was pumping blood and in a graveyard and the blood pump exploded all over me. And I looked like I'd just been drenched in blood. Um and there are little things that happen sometimes, a servo break. I was doing a, cre- a, a show in uh, Canada. We had a mechanical alligator, and um, we were watching the monitors, and somebody said, wow, the alligator looks really dusty today. Look, there's loads of dust around its head. And I looked at the monitor and went, that's not dust, that's smoke. I mean, his head's on fire. And I ran in, and his head was burning, and one of the servos had, started to, had, had a malfunction and was burning the rubber, and it was actually on fire. There were flames coming out of its head. So, I mean, um, yeah, you know, there are things tend to, uh, yeah, it's just all part of filmmaking. Um, you got to keep your cool, I guess, in those moments too. Well, again, I mean, luckily, you know, you can usually bullshit most directors and producers. Uh, David Fincher, you can't, you know, I mean, David Fincher on no. I mean, I remember, you know, the guys on Alien 3 tried to bullshit him a couple of times. He was like, no, that's not true. You know, he, he knows how to build things. So he knew so. Like Stephen Norrington, you can't you can't bullshit Stephen Norrington either, you know. Like he knows makeup effects and woe betide you if you try to lie to him, you know what I mean? So um you gotta pick and choose your moments. I mean, certain directors you could go, oh, you know, the inner gasket flange manipulator's broken on it, it'll be two minutes, we'll just take care of that. You know, it's like complete baloney, you know, horseshit. But someone like a Jim Cameron or a Stephen Norrington or a David Finch will, will be like, there's no such thing as a flange modulator. You know, you, you're lying. What's wrong? Um, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I mean, usually with makeup, makeup effects, especially it's just makeup deteriorating. You know, there's that, there's nothing worse than end of the day. They want to do a close up, and they put the camera here for a close up on the mouth. And, you know, and the director goes, I can see an edge. And you're like, dude it's 
you know, it's 14 hours he's been wearing this makeup. What do you expect? You know, what like, really? Do you, you ever have directors that think maybe we should shoot the close ups first? <laughs> oh, no. When we, but, but again, see, now that's a naivety of, see, makeup effects guys always want to shoot close ups first. And as a makeup effects artist, when I first started, I would say that. Why don't we shoot the close ups first? Now, having been a director, I know why you don't shoot the close ups first. You know, nobody shoots close-ups on a scene first. You start wide and you work your way in. That's the way it is. You know, that's that's just the natural way of shooting. You know, it would be crazy to shoot close-ups first. I mean, you could probably do a mass shot first if you really wanted to. But generally, by and large, standard coverage is, you know, you start wide, get your wide shot, shoot the scene, and then you start doing coverage of all the bits and pieces and you finish with close-ups. Um, especially when you're doing actors, because actors tend to, in the wide shot, they're, they're getting the feel for the scene. And by the time you get close on them for their single, they've really got the dialogue down. They know where they're at and uh, they give their best performances because they've been doing it for a morning. You know what I mean? They've been doing the same dialogue all morning. So they've figured out the kinks and the ripples and, you know, and really got, they've honed in their performances. Then they know the dialogue perfectly now and, uh, you know, they're ready to rock. So most people, by the time you get to the close-up, they're a lot better. If you would say to an actor in the scene, okay, I'm going to start with your close-up, they'd be like, whoa, what? I, I've only done the scene once, you know what I mean? Like, really? You know, I, I thought we'd, we were working our way into it. So that's why you don't do close-ups first. Um, when, go on. Well, no, go go on. I, I finished. Oh, I, I was going to say, uh, when you're doing the creature stuff, like uh, feast, creature design, does that mean that you get to design what the creature looks like? Are you given a storyboard or...? No, it's usually a description. Sometimes it's something, it's an elaborate description, and sometimes it's just the monster, you know? So it's like anything. You do designs, you do maquettes, you know, you pitch it to a studio. Sometimes some directors will be like, that's fantastic, we love it. Gary, you're the best. And some people are like, no, they can have bigger teeth, can have bigger arms. You know, if it's a, a dimension film, it used to be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of designs, you know. Can we have the teeth from design 1A and the legs from design 26 and the feet from design, you know, like mixing it, like Mr. Potato who trying to fit the creature together, you know. Um, sometimes they'll bring other designers in and they design something. Sometimes it's like, you know, you end up, you design, you design a creature, the first design you give them, they're like, no, 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 no. You do 25 other designs. They bring in other designers and then they'll go, what was that design you showed us at the very beginning and you showed them number one and they go, yeah, that's really great actually. And you're like, fuck me, that's the first thing I showed them, you know what I mean? Um, some designs, I mean, the Angelique Cenobite, Cenobite from uh, Bloodline. I mean, I was, we were just starting prep on that, and I came home one night, and my girlfriend was watching, um, uh, Sister Act 2, and I looked at a nun's cowl, and I said, Wouldn't that be cool in flesh? You know, literally, that was uh, that would be so cool in flesh. Um, with the, you know, I, I literally, I drew something like like that. Uh, I see. That was all I drew. Uh, and I went to my friend Miles Tevis, who's a brilliant designer, and I said, I think that would make a really cool Cenobite. Like, oh, is it going to be like that? That would make a cool right, Cenobite. Right. And with wires attached to her neck. And um, and he did a drawing, and that's what it ended up being. And I mean, and literally, the director was like, yeah, that's fantastic. It was a very simple concept. It worked, and it worked on the day. So sometimes it's that quick. It's that fast. Wow. Um, other times, you know, I mean, creatures need design. I mean, Pumpkinhead, that was what was hard about Pumpkinhead for me doing the three and four because all I wanted to do was do Stan Winston's design. You know, to me, that design was absolutely perfect. But the two directors didn't want it to be the same. They wanted the teeth missing from the mouth and they wanted to add these spines on the neck. And I didn't agree with it. I really didn't agree with it. I was like, guys, it's a perfect design, you know. Um, but that's what they wanted. For Feast, I just wanted um, – what I was responsible for was I said, wouldn't it be cool if the creature was two creatures, you know, like it's 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 two things? Because the idea was this creature had been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, to which I was like, well, if, if it's been around for hundreds of years, then we would have seen it, you know, you would have seen it. We would have had evidence of it, you know. So I – came up with the idea that maybe it had some kind of like Native American look to it, which is why they had the kind of furry, you know, the, the pelts of animals with the bones on the face so that it looked like something from like a, uh, like a Native American dance or something. You might have seen around a fire, you know, 
Um, but then underneath are these very powerful creatures. And I just said they should look like linebackers. And I like creatures that, that, that there's no subtlety to what they are. They're going to try and eat you. So I'm like lots of fucking teeth. You know, I like creatures that have got rah, 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 you know, big teeth. So if you look at the design for animal or the creature from feast, there's lots of teeth on it. You know what I mean? Like they just, you know, I just like creatures that got lots of teeth. To me, it should look like you, when you look at it, you go, that is going to try and fucking kill me. Like it's not going to try and smile at me or pat me on the head. It's got a big mouthful of razor sharp teeth. Clearly it's going to fuck me up. I think it should be that quick. It's like it's like a white shark. When you see it over his mouth, you know you're in trouble. You know. It's funny you mentioned uh, pumpkin head because I was just reading a, a pumpkin head. I was just reading a um, top ten list, the top ten '80s horror movies that are so bad they're good, and they listed pumpkin head. And I thought, how in any universe is that so bad? It's good. It's just a good melodrama. If you're comparing it to like Citizen Kane or some high ambiguity drama, uh, then I then maybe I don't know. But they're two completely different types of movies. What do you think about the way people treat horror films or how hard people can be on some of the films you've worked on? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I think there's definitely a snobbery towards horror films. I had this out. I had, I had a big fight with a, an AD on Exorcist at the beginning, a guy called Bruce Franklin who basically, I, you know, uh, we were talking about Exorcist and I said how Exorcist, the original, was one of the greatest films ever made. And he was like, oh, that's rubbish. You know, you can't say that. He said, it's, you know, horror films are just garbage. He said, I'm only working with this to work on with Rennie Harlan. And I said, I said, that's ridiculous. I said, horror films, I said, most of the most most of the best directors in the world have done horror films. And he said, that's not true. And I was like, you're, you're joking, all right? I was like, that's you're talking horseshit. And he's like, no, I'm not. Horror films have got no credibility. And I was like, Friedkin, The Exorcist, Kubrick, The Shining, Coppola, Dracula, you know, Oliver Stone, The Hand. You know, I was like, you know, do you want to keep going? I was like, you know, Joe Dante, Sam Raimi, you know, John David Cronenberg, you know. I mean, there's basically an entire David generation Lee. of people that basically were brought up through the Roger Corman studio system. <laughs> James Cameron, you know, it's like, yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, you know, like any genre of film, I think I think what's good about horror films is that they allow um, directors to cut their teeth, no pun intended, you know. I mean, again, a horror film, Spielberg, you know, Jaws, for Christ's sake, and Duel. Um, so, I mean, I, I think what's fun about the horror genre is as a filmmaker, especially as a, in, in, like people like DPs, you can do outlandish things and have fun with it. Me... I would never want to direct a romantic comedy. I've got no interest in it. Um, I, I like directing fantastical, weird shit. You know what I mean? I mean, to, unless unless I'm going to do something really bizarre and strange, I've got no interest in filming that kind of stuff at all. I wouldn't imagine that Rob Zombie would like to make a you know a robbery movie. I'm sure he likes shooting his weird images. You know, that's what I'm into. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I did. I definitely feel like there's a, a snobbery in Hollywood and um, towards horror films. Uh, I think that's why people like. Jason Blum kind of think it's hilarious that they're doing so well and making so much money off these, these uh, you know, these films that have no credibility. I, I think even the horror movie fans can be tough on horror films. I mean, oh, you've worked God. on a lot of sequels oh. and there's there's people that are like, oh, Hellraiser Judgment. It's just seven combined with Hellraiser and it's not even Doug Bradley. Like, it's a good movie. <coughs> oh no, horror fans are the most uh, you know visceral of the lot, without doubt. I mean, I say this all the time. Um, my friends uh, produced a film called Trekkies many years ago, and they said we're you know we were thinking about doing a, a film on on science fiction fans or something else. I said you should do horror fans. I said they're the worst. I said horror fans are the most venomous. You know, tear it down. Uh, but that's what horror is all about. I mean, you know. You don't have, you know, romantic comedy conventions. You don't have, you know, heist movie conventions. You don't have, you know, rom-com conventions. You have horror film conventions because they polarize audiences. And uh, you can get horror fans arguing, you know, you can put any movie and it will divide an audience 50-50. So the very most you, most you can ever hope for is people to go, oh, you know, you know to have somebody say they liked it. Uh, and what one person's favorite horror film is is, is some people hate, you know, and will scream, oh, my God, I hate that film more than anything else. So, um, yeah, they're, uh, they're a vocal bunch, absolutely. They, and they, they're not, they're not, you know, they, uh, the only times they don't actually tend to 
what, what I would say is horror fans are very vocal online and in comments on online. But if you meet them in person, they, I've never seen them say anything nasty to anybody. This is where some horror actors get confused, I think, that they think the films they've done are the best in the world because horror film fans tend to be very, very gracious at conventions and go and go, oh, I loved your movie. And if you're a convention person signing stuff all day long and that's all you hear and never hear any detractors, then you're going to start to believe this, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> you know, Sammy Hagar wouldn't said it, you know, about, about Van Halen. He said, look, I've never met anyone who doesn't like David Lee Roth more than me. He said, but I know that there are people who clearly love David Lee Roth more than me. Probably people who've told me that they love David, me look more than David Lee Roth, but, but they wouldn't say that to me. Why would you? No one's going to walk up to Doug Bradley and say, oh, Mr. Bradley, please sign this for me. By the way, I really like the guy in Judgment. <laughs> you know what I mean? They wouldn't say that. Same as they wouldn't walk up to Paul Taylor and say, hi, I really love you, Mr. Taylor. Can you sign this? But I much prefer Doug Bradley. You were a, real, a poor second. They're going to tell him he's the best and that they loved him. You know what I mean? It's the way it is. Same as I'd be very surprised if I was signing something, if someone would, you know, if I was signing something for people and maybe people were getting something signed, that one person would push past and go, oh, you're going to if judgment sucked. You know, maybe they would. I've never had it. I've never had anyone walk up to me directly and say they thought my film was lousy. But I mean, I'm, I know there are people out there uh, who think that, you know. So, so, so I have to admit, as, as, from one horror fan to another, the only part of this interview that has disappointed me is finding out the first movie I named when you came on, Ginger Snaps. And yes, that is my favorite werewolf movie. I don't care. I love The Howling. I love American Werewolf in London. But Ginger Snaps just does it for me. And I wanted to talk about it. And you just sort of shot it down. You were like, I didn't really do much with that. I didn't. I was up in, what was I doing in Canada? Well, it's, it says uh, on IMDb that you were the makeup effects sculptor. I don't know what that means. I sculpted one stage of the makeup. The only thing I ever remember really, really doing for Ginger Snaps is Paul Jones, who uh, is somebody I've known for a long, long time. Um, he designed the werewolf, which I'll be honest with you, and if Paul's watching this, I don't think it's a very good werewolf. I've never thought. I don't like the sneak sniffles thing. I've just never thought it was a very good design for the werewolf. But um, I remember vividly sculpting the makeup for the uh second stage when she's infected when she's becoming the werewolf and i did this eye thing like that where it went into her eyes here like it started here that was my contribution i remember sculpting that and paul going oh that's kind of cool uh and i said yeah we'd be called to do a thing going like a tear ducts have got long um so really i was involved in the makeup but i was there painting on um i think he was doing affects the series you know or something like that or earth final conflict and and i knew paul and he said you know come up and would you help out so that's all i did i went up uh, and then i remember sean harrison and kate hill were over there sculpting this werewolf creature and i've always i like werewolves that are bipeds i just think werewolves are cool as bipeds i don't like them as four-legged creatures i always think they look dumb because the only way you can do it is put a person in a suit and that never works because they always look like they're a person on all fours running around or they've got really horrible leg extensions on, uh, or it's a person in a wheelbarrow like American Wolf in London. I mean, again, this is only my opinion, but I love the wheel transformation in American Wolf in London. I love everything about it, but I don't like the the running four-legged werewolf thing. I just don't like it. It's just not my idea of... Uh, I like werewolves to stand up. Everything from Curse of the Werewolf to the Howling to... I just think werewolves are cool as bipeds, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, I'm sorry. I sorry I crushed your dreams about about ginger snaps. Really sorry, dude. I'm, I'm I feel really really bad. But I think what I mean, I, I've only I've only seen the film once. But it seems to me everyone, what everyone really gravitated to that movie was the kind of the teen angst in it. You know what I mean? That was what really everyone really dug. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it's very story oriented. Yeah, which is cool. Which is where the best horror films are, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I should have worked on Dog Soldiers because the company I, I, you know, was involved in Image Animation, they did Dog, dog Soldiers. I thought those were cool werewolves. One of the coolest werewolves I ever liked was the one that Dave Elsie did for um, for Waxworks, the original Waxwork. I always thought that was a really good werewolf in the, in there. You worked oh, on the oh. sequel to that as well, right? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I did. I did. But again, I was barely doing anything. I was like a tech in the lab, you know what I mean? Stephen Norrington worked on that as well. Stephen Norrington, yeah, he, he did the mechanic mech, 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 he did the mechanics for the Panther Woman. 
So, yeah, that's when I first got to know Stephen and uh, what an interesting character he was. We'll have to leave that for a part two. I, I need to have you on again maybe next Halloween. But uh, you've been really gracious with your time. I'm trying to think of stuff that we did. I mean, I mean, really, the, the, you know, Exorcist was a lot of effects and makeups and animatronics as well because we got all hyenas for that. Um, in terms of creature suits, I mean, yeah, the, the 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 big ones were the pumpkin head and feast and animal, which I did for a Drew Barrymore film. Um, but again, really, over the years, it's been a lot of Hellraisers and a lot of a lot of general uh, blood and guts and killing. You know, what, wasn't there a weird thing with the Exorcist at the beginning yeah. where? Oh, like yeah. they they cut out parts with the animatronic hyenas and they replaced it with CGI or yeah that's a troubled film. There's like two versions of it. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I was uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's 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 there's a legacy to that film that's very interesting. Um, and I was brought in, you know, originally it's going to be Patrick Lussier shooting reshoots that were going to be enhanced, and then Patrick was unavailable, so Renny Harling came in and it was deemed not to do reshoots but to do the whole shoot the whole movie which was shot for a very low number. Um, but no, the plan was always to have some digital hyenas in it. Um, I just don't think the digital hyenas were as good as they hoped they were going to be. Um, but most of the stuff was puppets. We did um, mechanical hyenas that would stand up and look around. And then we did glove puppets. Uh, so all the shots of the kid being ripped apart were all uh, fake limbs and me with a a uh, glove puppet hyena with rubber teeth and blood tubes in its mouth so we could bite onto things and then uh, chew them and rip them apart. And we shot loads and loads of that. So and do you have to it. make the puppets and then also uh, prop them up during the scenes? Do you do you, do you multitask? Oh, yeah, you puppeteer them, absolutely. Oh, no, you always want to puppeteer your own creatures. First of all, um, you get sag residuals because <laughs> you're an actor then, uh, which is really, really good. But also I think, I think makeup effects people tend to make very good Creature performers, Mike Regan, who's uh, worked for me for many, many years. He played Chatterer. He played Pumpkinhead. He played the Feast Creature. I played the Feast Creature. He, we both played Mimics. So makeup effects guys tend to look after suits very, very well because you know what can break on them. Um, and I think all makeup effects artists are basically frustrated monsters. So you always want to try and play your creatures. Same as in Piranha. We had a lot of um, glove puppet piranhas biting people with rubber teeth and they're, they're me puppeteering the puppets you know or they're on sticks and stuff like that uh, you just tend to know how they're going to move better than anything else so you know you never bring in just a, a puppeteer to puppeteer a creature you tend to puppeteer the creatures did you have to work underwater in certain scenes yeah. for what, what was that like is that weird or well i'm a, a trained diver anyway so i mean um it was great fun i mean i i would it, to me it was it was a it was a busman's holiday you know what i mean like any chance you can get to for me to have a scuba tank on my back is uh, is great. So I'm like, wow, I'm being paid to actually scuba dive now. This is fantastic. Uh, you know, it definitely makes things tricky, but it's great fun to be underwater with a giant puppet, you know, wearing a scuba suit, you know, doing that kind of thing. How, how many of those films are made outside of the U.S.? Because I know a lot of the horror movies get made in places. Well, you're in Eastern Europe now. And a lot of them get made there. I think Bride of Chucky or Seed of Chucky was made there. I know the Pumpkinhead sequels were. Uh, is that just to cut down on budgets? Yeah, no. Certain countries were at different times. Uh, Canada was very cheap for a while. Um, then That's Romania, why they made the Romero, uh, like, Land of the Dead stuff there. Yeah. Yeah, Canada was very cheap for a while. It was good rebates. And then in America, uh, in the last 10 years, certain places had great rebates. Louisiana, the tons of films made in Louisiana. We did two, two Paul sequels there, and uh, God, we did, and the Feast sequels were done in Louisiana. Again, it all comes down to rebates and cost of labor and stuff like that. Any times you're trying to, times you're trying to whittle down your budget, um, you know, that's, I mean, you know, Atlanta, that's why Walking Dead was shot in Atlanta, you know, and Atlanta has become very, very um, prolific now. Pyramid Studios is there, they do a lot of the Marvel films in Atlanta. You know, Hollywood and, you know, what was the classic, you know, Los Angeles and London for shooting films. Now you can make films anywhere in the world now. You know, there's talent all over the world and great studios and great facilities. And sometimes the tax incentives, again, that's why films have been shot in England for a long time, because there's great incentives on budgets. You know, the government will uh, subsidize these films. So in closing, I always like to end on a, a positive note. What would your oh, advice be? Everything's oh, positive. everything is positive, but I, I wanted to get uh, you to maybe I, I have listeners that want to get into 
uh, film or, or makeup effects. I mean, we have Savini's school here. What would your advice be uh, to folks that want to get involved in making some movie magic? Uh, honestly, learn computer graphics. You know, learn, learn ZBrush, make creatures in the computer. Uh, you know, you've got much more of a chance of being able to earn a very nice living uh, doing it that way. And then you could make creatures in your garage on the weekends if you wanted to for Halloween and for stuff like that. Because the reality is, is that it's going to go more digital in the future. Uh, and there's going to be more work for you. Um, you know, I, I personally believe that we're on the edge of a of a massive change in terms of uh, with using deep fake technology, you know, uh, for makeups. Because once people realize that you could apply makeup one time, shoot all of your footage and then deep fake it onto an actor, you won't need to have makeup artists there every day applying makeup. Yeah, I actually, I've seen some deep fake stuff and I just look at it and I'm like, whoa, this is like kind of creepy to me how, how you know, they, they can put Nicolas Cage's face on uh, Danny Tanner from Full House and it looks uh, pretty decent. <laughs> no, nah, and the thing is what, you know, what you have to realize is the way it looks now is the worst it's ever going to look, you know, it's, it's only ever going to look better and better and better. So if you imagine a situation where if you were to take, say, Charlize Theron as Megyn Kelly in Bombshell and be able to take that look and put it on Charlize Theron in an alien movie, then you've just gotten rid of the fact that you don't need to have a makeup artist there applying the makeup every day. And what's also really interesting is deep fake technology, unlike um, face replacement or CGI kind of like face building, like the Grand Moff Tarkin character in... Um, uh, Rogue One, is it Rogue One? Yeah, Rogue One. Yeah, yeah. Um, this deepfake technology is software AI. You know, it's a learning technology, so you don't need to uh, monitor it. You just let the computer do its own thing. So I would say, for people wanting to get into it, if you want a, a lengthy, long time career, then you should start studying ZBrush and um, CGI. You know, learning to do, you know, learn After Effects and stuff like that, and your computer learn how to do deepfake and stuff like that, because I understand that people want tactile. I want to make creatures. I want to make monsters. And all that. It's like, well, what you want and what's going to change. I mean, look at the way filmmaking is changing already with things like The Mandalorian, when the way they're shooting in the volume. You know, think about it. Let's go and shoot a film, uh, you know, in New Zealand. We're going to take 200 people in trailers and trucks and ship them all out into the middle of the wilderness in New Zealand to shoot a waterfall sequence. Or are we going to have it all done on the stage in Los Angeles? Uh, on a giant volume screen, you know what I mean? And if it looks as good as The Mandalorian looks, then why would you need to go anywhere? And it's only going to get better and better and better to a situation where, I mean, I don't know if you saw the making of The Lion King, but when you saw John Favreau and those guys wearing, you know, um, Oculus headsets, basically, and doing, you know, walking around a virtual set while sitting in a room, well, it's, it's scary. That's where it's going to go. So if you're 22 years old and you want to get into the film industry, I wouldn't suggest you're learning about making prosthetic creatures and monsters. I'd suggest you should, uh, you know, look at your computer. Um, Fair enough. I mean, that, that's almost a sorrowful way to end it in a way because uh, I think people love those practical effects. But I guess uh, what projects do. do you have? They do. They do. But at the same time, uh, you know, like, you know, I mean, you know, it's, Look, I love creature effects. I do, but the truth is, you know, you get, you know, you get a, a puppet on set, and it's like, it's like, oh look, rrr, puppet, rrr, it's attacking somebody, and it, you're locked off onto a situation where it's a guy in a suit, and you clearly know it's a guy in a suit. It's a very nice guy in a suit, but it's still look, that's a guy in a suit, right? Uh, maybe you stretch out the legs a little bit, make them longer, and all that. But there's a certain point where CGI goes, guys will say, look, if you're gonna, if we're gonna stretch his legs and stretch his arms, we might as well just build the whole thing in the computer, you know, and. Um, it, it, it is. I mean, I think there's still a blending of the technologies, but it's only ever going to get better and better. I mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding in CGI where people see things and people go, oh, man, it looks so computer generated. That fucking sucks, dude. It looks awful, man. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of creature effects where you watch it and go, dude, that, that's a fucking really bad puppet, right? You know, I mean, like, you know, that's a that's a lame looking, you know, rubber head. Or, ah, you know, I mean, I don't think anybody looks at the end of Total Recall and says, that looks just like Arnold Schwarzenegger going, you know, it's a good puppy for the time, but it looks a bit lame now. Um, you know, and I've, you know, I've seen people on set with, with, with those things like Dada and the producers are like, really? That's what we bought? That's what we paid for? So that looks like shit. Um, 
so it's you know cgi is i always say it's like um cgi is like hair plugs you know like hair transplants if it's done really really well you can't tell if it's done badly it's very very obvious well uh, i mean the other thing is sometimes it's necessary you know i always love that story uh from the set of jeepers creepers where they said real crows would not perform so we had to get cgi crows yeah no, it's true, you know, and CGI, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we see now in movies that people don't even realize is CGI. You go, did you realize all that background? Like you, you watch the VFX breakdowns for something like The Shape in the Water, and everyone's like, oh, well, the creature, right? And it's like, did you see how much set enhancement they did on that? Adding lights and see, and streets and everything else, and people have no idea. It's like, that's brilliant, beautiful set work, or something like um, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. It's like, that was shot in the summer in Sweden, not in the winter, you know? It's like beautiful cgi snow flurries and all that kind of stuff or the motorcycle sequence which is all cgi um when it's done well it's 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 brilliant you know and sometimes it's just a question of money um you know you watch something like the avengers movies you, know, you can't honestly tell me that you could do that with creature effects you know you know you, could, you couldn't you know i mean you know you, you look back at what steve johnson was trying to build for the hulk and you see it and you go oh look at that you know and there's a big giant hulk puppet going and you go, yeah, it's really cool, but would it have worked? You imagine trying to film with that thing? You know, you, you, you'd have to kind of like really pick your shots and it's on a big motion base. You have to push it around and it wouldn't, you'd never get any, you never get shots of it running around. It's like the only way to do something like that is CGI. I mean, that's why, to be honest, we've, um, we've seen such a huge, domination with the marvel movies because i think it took years for technology to catch up with what you could do you know in a marvel comic you know i mean uh <laughs> you only have to look back at the 1970s spider-man movie you know with patrick duffy you know kind of like you know and a bit cotton web flying out or a guy running up the side of a building and it's like the only way to do it is cgi it's the only way to physically do it all the great makeup effects in the world i'm going to fix that now don't get me wrong there are certain things that makeup effects is brilliant for uh, Walking Dead, you know, great zombie movies and stuff like that. Fantastic. Low budget horror, you know, it's perfect. Uh, but I mean, it's it's definitely, I definitely don't think we'll see something like, um, or, or we're definitely getting further and further away from it, building giant mechanical Godzillas or giant mechanical dinosaurs for Jurassic Park. And it is sad, undoubtedly. I mean, you know, I've been lucky enough to work in a few shops where you have these things and you look at it and you go, look at that. That's amazing, beautiful technology and great artistry and engineering. And it, you can see genuine life in these in these creations. Um, but, you know, uh, but it's tethered to a thing on the floor, you know, or it, it, can't, it can only move around in a certain shot. Whereas, you know, there is no limit to what CGI can do, no limit at all. And it's only ever getting better and better and better gets better all the time i mean that's the only the problem really is that cgi that you thought was so good 10 years ago uh you know is looks really bad now i was talking about this the other day about spider-man i mean um i still think spider-man 2 is a fantastic film really really good great story great villain everything about that spider-man movie is pretty much perfect uh, and i remember at the time thinking the cgi was amazing you go back now and look at it and the cgi is a bit ropey you know it's 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 just not as as detailed i mean it's still very very it still works but i would love to see the um the uh train fight sequence done with today's cgi uh you know because i'm sure it would look even better but it's pretty fucking good at the time but that movie is a really damn good spider-man movie you know well i would concur on that uh gary j tunnicliffe Tunnicliff. i want to thank you for You're coming on welcome. parallax views uh if you could uh how can my listeners keep up with your work and do you have any uh future projects let me show one thing as an upbeat i would say the one thing that you should be upbeat about though is is uh you know when i grew up to be a filmmaker you know you had to you know you, everyone started off making eight millimeter films we had to buy eight millimeter cameras you know with little magazines of films and you would have to pipe this very expensive film and you would have to shoot your little movie uh, and then send it off to a, a chemist and get your lab back and you have to project it. You know, if you want to be excited about something, be excited about this, that you could shoot a fucking movie on this thing. You know what I mean? You can shoot a whole movie. I mean, the new on an iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. 
the new 12 is, I mean, it's got incredible lenses on it, slow motion effects. You can edit the whole thing on this. So, I mean, I would have killed for this when I was 12 or 13 years old when I made Attack of the Killer Hamster, you know, which I did when I was 12 years old on Super 8. You can make movies. That's what's great. So Jim Cameron said, you know, that, you know, if you're if you're shooting a movie, you're a director, you know. Uh, the only difference between me and you is budget and production. And it's true. So you can be a filmmaker. So this is, to me, far more exciting than making Rubber Monsters is the fact that you can shoot a movie. So if you want to be in film, you know, get, you know, get your little film camera, get your your freaking iphone and a simple editing program and start editing scenes you'll learn more about filmmaking than you could possibly hope but shoot a scene with your dog or your cat or your sister or your brother and shoot a little movie and edit it together and put some special effects on it that to me is the most exciting thing in the world is that everyone can be a filmmaker now anyone can make a, a, a movie with great editing programs and you can buy a couple of apps and have a great time and uh and um, and shoot your own little movies. That is really exciting and really happy, uh, and really a thing to be you know to be thrilled about. Because like I say, to me it was always like I had ideas for films, but um, couldn't do it because the technology was beyond me. You know, having to buy film and process it and edit it on a flatbed and make a little home edit station. You know, now you can just do it all in the thing. Um, regarding me, um, I, I don't do much social uh, media. I'm on Instagram under Hollywood Assassin, where I post stupid photos. I have a website, uh, www.twohoursinthedark.net. But I am doing a thing quite recent, just recently started for Midnight's Edge, who do podcast on YouTube, and I'm kind of guesting on there. They do a live in the morning thing every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, 9 a.m. and LA time, and I'm on one on Friday, but I'm starting to do that quite regularly. So uh, tune into Midnight's Edge, and you might see me uh, waxing lyrical and talking utter nonsense for hours on end about film and effects and uh, my opinions on Hollywood and stuff like that. Well, hey, I have to thank you again. This has been a really great episode, and you were very gracious with your time. So thanks again, no, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, we covered the gamut, right? We did everything from, you know, the Harvey Weinstein scandal to, uh, you know, blood and guts and horror. Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gary J. Tunnicliffe. And, of course, if you appreciate the work here I do at Parallax News, please, please, please consider supporting me at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. There's a $1, $5, $10, $15, and even a $100 tier. Any amount will help, so I really, really would appreciate if you could kick me even a few dollars on my Patreon page at, again, patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And at the $10 and $15 tiers, you get a producer's credit shout out. So let's quickly get those out there before we end this edition of the program. Producer's credit shout outs to Mark, Arlen, Spartacus, Gunner, Ed, Grass, James, Mickey, Brian, The War Nerd, The 42 Group, Nick, Emilia, Chase, Chris, Orc, Black Tuna, Catherine, Nathan, David, Holland, Martin, Stu, and Jeffrey. If you'd like your very own producer's credit on each and every edition of Parallax Views, well, then consider joining those listeners and supporting me at the $10 or $15 tiers. At the $5 tier, I'm releasing bonus content. Tomorrow, I should be releasing a few archived editions of Parallax Views as bonus content for $5 tier and above supporters. And I have a series that I am working on editing featuring blogger These Long Wars on the covert history of George H.W. Bush. That may be out the 1st or 2nd of November. Part 2 of that series may be out, I should say, by the 1st or 2nd of November, but I'm hoping I can get it out before Halloween. So again, if you can, please consider supporting me at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. That's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And with that being said... Until next time, you've been listening to Parallax Views with Parallax Views. Parallax Views with Parallax Views. The way out is not simply to say, don't do it, just to prohibit. It's nothing else. 
if we don't do it, others will be doing it like right. So, you know, we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff is a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight. With no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.